My name is Betsy Peterson, and I'm the director of the American Folklife Center, and I want to welcome you on behalf of all of the staff here. Um, the idea or the seeds for this symposium were planted a few years ago by Kathy Kirst and have been further developed over the years by Nancy Gross and other staff um, as we have engaged in planning discussions about um, programming and further collection development. So we see this as the first of several programs and or activities over the next 18 to 24 months. Um, and we're not fully sure what those activities, um, you know, what shape they're going to take and in fact want your help in, in fleshing out what some of those things might be. At the end of the day here, we will have a final discussion and we very much want to talk with all of you about your experience here today and also what you would like to see in the future. We know that whatever we do, we do want to focus on historical collections that are already in the archive, but we very much want to focus on current and future work to be done by women ethnographers, folklorists, ethnomusicologists, et cetera. So um, again, thank you. Uh, I apologize. I have to rush out for um, a little bit, but we'll be back. Um, and I know Nancy, in the meantime, Nancy Gross has some logistical announcements uh, to share with everyone before we get going. So welcome. Good morning, thanks so much for coming. W we see this as the beginning event of what will be for the American Folklife Center probably two years of programming that will include lectures and um, some other activities and a few more conferences and a lot of input highlighting our women-generated collections here. We know there are many of them um, of these collections. We actually don't have a final count. And it, sometimes it depends on how you, uh, who you credit with bringing in collections and doing collections and who's involved. So we'll be touching on some of that today. Right now, just for logistics, we're going to have uh, morning activities and we're going to break at uh, 12, 15, I think it is. Um, this is, you're in the Madison Building of the Library of Congress. The uh, Folklife Reading Room, the American Folklife Center Reading Room is not in this building. It's in the Jefferson Building, the other building across the way. There are tunnels connecting them. If you want to go during lunch hour and check out our reading room, you'd be most welcome. However, you also might want to go upstairs to the sixth floor and get lunch. There's, um, or, or you're welcome to go out of the building, but we only have allowed an hour and a quarter for lunch. So I uh, think we'd recommend the cafeteria upstairs. And then we'll have afternoon activities and we'll end with a reception at five. We hope you'll, at least some of you will be able to stick around for that. So um, uh, the other important things to know when you go to a conference is that there are restrooms on this floor. If you go out the door and it's to your right, I think, I don't think anybody drove. I think we're taking care of all the parking. So I think we're, we're all set. So again, welcome. And for us, this is, as I say, embarking on a longer um, commitment to this topic and to expanding what we know and, and asking you to help us expand that knowledge. So it's very much uh, a work in progress. So thank you for coming, and we look forward to working with you today and, and, and also in, in the years to come. So let me start by introducing the moderator for our next panel, who is Kathy Kirst. Um, Kathy was a folklife specialist here at the library for 27 years, I think, and she's now a, a, a emeritus, emerita. And so she, uh, she was the one who came up with the idea of uh, drew our attention to how many collections of the, is it 3,200 collections we have now, Todd, or 3,500? We have a lot of collections, but an awful lot of, a very high percentage of them were 
um, done by women. Um, and we often, when we turn around to tell people what we have, it's often not their collections that we emphasize. So we want to just kind of correct that imbalance. So um, Dr. Kirst is um, well known and various, um, especially for her work on the New Deal. And uh, in fact, she's working on a, a book uh, a presentation with Dust to Digital in the library right now on Sid Sidney Robinson Cowell, and uh, we'll be, uh, I'm sure we'll be glad to talk about it during the breaks. Um, she received um, an MA in Scandinavian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and did her PhD through the folklore program at George Washington University. Um, fortunately, she lives in the area, so we get to talk to her frequently, but we miss her here at the center, so we're delighted she's back today. So I'd ask her to come up to moderate the next panel. Thank you so much, Nancy, for that kind introduction. I am thrilled, you can imagine, that we're having this symposium today and that there are plans to do more programs because the women's collections in the American Folklife Center are really quite amazing from every era with significant contributions that really many people have never heard about and that maybe even staff have not totally uncovered. So. Um, that's really a thrill. Um, our first session will be uh, called Documentation and Archival Collections. And our first speaker is Aldona Dye, who is a doctoral student at the University of Virginia in the Department of Music. She is working on a really exciting project um, or a dissertation um, about amateur women folk music collectors. Um, she's changed the name of her uh, title slightly, and it's called A Corps of Trained Workers, colon, Virginia's Ballads Collecting School Teachers. So I'd like you to welcome um, Aldona Dye. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Hi everyone, good morning. It's uh, great to be here today. It's great to be here at this event, and it's also great to be here at the Library of Congress. Um, as a grad student at a university, it's actually really exciting for me to present my work in a public space instead of an academic sanctioned space, so that's really exciting for me. Um, Today I'm going to talk to you guys about the Virginia Folklore Society. Um, their papers are at the University of Virginia, but there's also um, a Library of Congress connection, which I'll get to at the, I guess at the end. Um, but I'm guessing that a lot of, okay. Um, I'm guessing that not a lot of people here are familiar with the Virginia Folklore Society, um, so I'm going to give you a brief overview. So founded in April 17th, 1913, the Virginia Folklore Society is one of the oldest state folklore societies in the country. Um, it was founded by University of Virginia professor Charles Alfonso Smith, and um, they began collecting English and Scottish ballads in the Virginia mountains. Virginia was seen as this sort of hotbed of English and Scottish folk music. So they set out to collect that. But they began to branch out pretty considerably um, about 10 years after they started, Arthur Kyle Davis took over in 1940, uh, sorry, 1924, and under his direction, they published three books um, of Virginia ballads and folk songs. Um, there was Traditional Ballads of Virginia in 1929, uh, Folk Songs of Virginia, a Descriptive Index in 1948, and More Traditional Ballads of Virginia in 1961. Um, they also, under the direction of Arthur Kyle Davis, did some sound recordings. Um, and I'll be playing one of those later on. And they did a couple recording trips um, from 1932 to 36, another in 1948, <laughs> and then another in 1961. So it actually roughly corresponds to um, the books that they put out. In the 1970s, um, Chuck and Nancy Perdue took over, and uh, they incorporated the Virginia Folklore Society into a nonprofit which directly led to the founding of the Virginia Folklife Program at Virginia Humanities. Um, 
And they published several volumes of Virginia folklore drawn from federal writers' project, uh, portraits of the New Deal and ex-slave narratives, um, and the archive collections for the Virginia Folklore Society were accessioned and organized during their tenure. Um, and actually, the Purdue papers have recently been accessioned at the um, UVA library, and thanks to my friend and colleague, Sophia Bramowitz, and so we're really excited to get into those. So I'm part of a group of uh, academics, writers, and artists interested in the Virginia Folklore Society. Um, we've sort of <laughs> become friends all through um, our connection to the Virginia Folklore Society. And we've been looking through the archives at the university. Um, we've done some ancestry work on the folk singers. We've connected some materials um, to living descendants of those singers and um, gotten to talk to the families. And um, ultimately, we're trying to release a box set of recordings um, with extensive historical liner notes. Um, yeah, my partner Daniel Bachman is here, and he probably knows more about the recording phase <laughs> than anyone alive today, um, but he knows a lot. Um, but today, I'm going to talk to you about one facet of the Virginia Folklore Society that I've focused on. And that's namely, that's the society's partnership with Virginia school teachers and the school teachers work as ballad collectors in the early years of the society. Today I'm going to talk about the initial partnership and what the Virginia Folklore Society desired from the, the teachers and what they expected to get from them. And then I'll show how that partnership brought in a whole lot of women and also what that actually got, how that changed the scope of the materials collected. Um, I'm a musicologist and so what's a particular interest to me is that it was specifically a musical element. And then I'll focus on Alfreda Peel. Uh, she was a school teacher in Salem, Virginia, who was active in the Virginia Folklore Society performing many roles and whose work directly impacted recordings that Alan Lomax made in Virginia in 1941. And this work is a chapter of my dissertation on uh, white womanhood and folklore, uh, folk song collection in the early 20th century. So my dissertation has two critical goals. The first is to call attention to understudied uh, women folk song collectors, um, several, actually all of whom, uh, who have contributed to some of the mostly canonical uh, collections. And also to look at how race, gender, and economic privilege are sort of inscribed into those collections, how um, the, these women's positionality as collectors um, how both folk song was a natural and easy thing for them to do, and also how their position, okay, how their position um, shaped the work that they did, how it even maybe uh, impacted how they heard the materials themselves and what they thought of it and what they did with it. So from the beginning, President Alfonso Smith was directly in correspondence with school teachers about English and Scottish ballads, and the teachers were showing their interest. Martha Davis, a teacher at the Harrisonburg Normal School, um, wrote to Alfonso Smith on March 26, 1913, saying that very much interested in an article in the New York Evening Post on March 24th, giving some details of your work in ballad hunting, and I hope you'll organize a ballad society. And she says, for several years, I've been making selections of ballads for literary and historical exercises, singing them to the old heirs. It would be quite easy to present the claims of ballads and ballad hunting to the normal school here. And even if nothing of great value should turn up, the interest would have a cultural value. So I'm seeing two things here. One is that she's already engaged in this work, right? Before the society's even started, she's already kind of using ballads in her own work um, for literary and historical exercises. And also that she sees that there would be interest. Other teachers <coughs> would be interested too. And less than a month later, when the Virginia Folklore Society was officially incorporated, teachers were written into the official procedures. The Department of Public Instruction and the Virginia Journal of Education publis publicized the Virginia Folklore Society in their official publications and used those publications to request that teachers submit ballads to the Virginia Folklore Society. Um, they held annual meetings with the State Teachers Association, um, liter uh, later called the Virginia Education Association. And these meetings continued up until the mid-70s. They held them in conjunction with the Virginia Education so uh, Association every year. And they also started ballad clubs at state teachers' colleges. 
Um, this one's at the State Normal School in Farmville, Virginia. Um, in their na April 1913 issue, um, they do document uh, the minutes and the proceedings of their ballot clubs. And so the ballot clubs at the state teachers' colleges were intro to introduce ballots into the curriculum. So when these teachers would go off um, to their posts, they would incorporate that and ask their students if they knew any ballads. Um, and also the Virginia Folklore Society, Society tried to engage the teachers in competition with one another, like who could collect the most ballads. Um, and <laughs> obviously there's an ulterior motive there, but it was uh, also seemed like it was a fun thing. And this partnership was written about, um, it was very much inscribed in the, in the official proceedings, and it was written about by Arthur Kyle Davis in 1930 in an article that he wrote called On the Collecting of Editing and Editing of Ballads. In that article, he talks about the divide, the division of labor between ballot collector and ballot editor, where school teachers were collecting and people at the University of Virginia, men at the University of Virginia, were editing. So, yeah, <laughs> there's two, there are two reasons for, uh, for this division of labor uh, that Davis stated in the article. The first was to cover a large area quickly. Virginia was seen as a hotbed of English and Scottish ballads, and they thought, you know, we have school teachers po um, posted in rural areas. They know their students. They know their students' families. We can easily get them to collect ballads and send them in far more easier than it would be if one person or even if a group of people stationed at the university were trying to go out and do that. So it's sort of this Ford assembly line model of ballad collecting. And it was also to maximize what um, they saw as the skills of each class of workers. Um, whereas the women were, uh, well, those teachers, I'm going to, I'll get to that a little bit. Was, as the teachers were um, talking to their students, were already posted out there, um, people at the university are what um, Davis characterized them as, quote, men of academic bent, little suited to work in the field, close quote. Um, more suited to looking at the materials and, you know, sussing out if they were really ballads, if they were really authentic. Um, and he called the group of field-working school teachers a core of trained workers and also stated that this plan to link the ballad quest with the educational system of the state constitutes perhaps the most significant and distinctive element of what I call the Virginia method. And it was effective. About 10 years after the society was founded, they had collected ballads from all 100 counties in Virginia, and they had found 51 ballads that were unique to Virginia, either in text or tune. When this happened, President Alfonso Smith wrote, celebrating, um, that Virginia has found and rescued more of these old world treasures than any other single state is due more to the interest and perseverance and intelligence of the teachers than to any or all other causes been pretty clear there. So obviously not every collector was a woman and not even all teachers were women, but a large number were. were. And this partnership really did bring women into a practice, um, the academic practice that was mainly the domain of men. Um, the annual bulletins throughout their collecting years show that during their most active years, the ratio of women to men collectors ranged in anywhere from three to one to even five to one. Um, in teaching as a profession in the early 20th century, very gendered, and normal schools where ballad clubs are housed were race and gender segregated. The Farmville Normal School that um, I showed earlier was founded at the end of the 19th century as the state normal school for white women. And we see a lot of we see a lot of evidence of the teachers in the archive. I mean, the archive is the Virginia Folklore Society archive, but you only really have to scratch the surface to see a bunch of women submitting, writing letters, um, and interesting to me, writing sheet music. Um, you just see a lot of ephemera um, that has that attests to the presence of women in their investment, and also. Um, shows how they were shaping the collection. Um, specifically, they added a musical element to what was considered a literary endeavor, a literary discipline. Um, and so time and time again, you see it's women who are pushing for music collection. So school teacher Juliet Fauntleroy of Alta Vista, Virginia. Oh, and by the way, all the pictures I'm showing are in the archive. 
Um, so school teacher um, Juliet Fauntleroy of Alta Vista, Virginia, um, who was one of the society's uh, leading collectors. Uh, she wrote in 1914, so just about a year after the Folklore Society had started. She wrote to Alfonso Smith saying, I do hope you'll publish all the airs you can find. Ballads can never live without music. Can you not induce other ballad collectors to write down the music also, or to get some musical friend to do it for them? And she wrote this after submitting her own um, notation. You also see in the Farmville Ballad Club, um, that although it wasn't founded to collect the music, they really quickly switched over um, and added a musical element too. Um, the m April 1913 edition that I showed you, this is a page from that too, and that was their second meeting. Um, and they wrote that the club voted that a committee should be appointed which should investigate the possibility of collecting the ballad tunes as well as the ballad verses in Virginia. So they're already branching out. And in their first publication in 1929, the Traditional Ballads of Virginia, um, the dedication page, or the, the foreword, um, credits two music teachers, Miss Margaret Snowden Broomall of New York City and Miss Betty Booker of Charlottesville, Virginia, with giving expert musical assistance without which this volume would have been bereft of song. And in the archive, um, like I said earlier, you see a lot of this ephemera that attests to the, the presence of women and their work and also kind of gets at this network of women. I think when Juliet Fauntleroy says, can you get a musical friend to do it for them? She's really speaking from experience um, with these like networks of musical women. Um, and you see that in, the, in this ephemera. I mean, this one I'm just gonna point out really quickly. So you s um, it was, this McAfee's Confession was sung by Mrs. Fred Spitzer of Harrisonburg, collected by Martha Davis, and transcribed by Eunice Kettering. And this one, um, Molly Bond, uh, sung by Texas Gladden of Back Creek, Virginia, collected by Miss Alfreda Peel of Salem, Virginia, and transcribed by Miss Kathleen Cox of Roanoke. So you really see, you know, people working together, um, especially yeah, a lot of musical friends. So what does is, what is this show? I mean, obviously it shows women's, uh, women's labor in the archive um, and the gendered labor of teaching, but it also, to me, it gets at um, a practice of specifically like white upper class womanhood um, working as how common it was to work as music teachers or amateur musicians playing piano in the homes, in school rooms, or in music clubs. Women's music clubs were a big, a big social outing. Um, and so yeah, you really get a sense of how these women were living their lives, not just how the ballad, um, the ballad work was going. And that clash, not clash, that collaboration. Um, it brings a musical element to what wasn't considered a musical element in the university before. And so I think Alfredo Marion Peel really exemplifies this sort of, um, this, this new kind of collector. Um, she was a school teacher in Salem, Virginia. Um, and up until her death in 1953, she was one of the most active collectors in the Virginia Folklore Society. And she singularly con collected a substantial portion of the material in the first volume. Um, and later on when they were making recordings, she actually lent her voice as a singer, um, which I'll play later. Um, and she was a folklorist in her own right. Um, she published a book called The Witch in the Mill in the 40s. Um, and this wasn't, um, this is her own work and it was a, a fictional account, but really highly inspired by witch lore that she collected in the mountains. She was really fascinated by witch lore. Um, I think that's another thing too. That's another thing that teachers are bringing in. They're always saying like, I have superstitions that I know. I, I have witch lore that I know. Like I know other songs. Like are you really just interested in the English and Scottish ballads? Like um, being in the mountains, I guess, um, you get a better sense of what's actually going on in Virginia than what's just the surviving English and Scottish ballads. Um, and her womanhood was a big part of, um, it seemed to be a big part of her experience as a collector. And you see this in some of the narratives that she has written down that you can find in the Virginia Folklore Society archive. Um, she has an account of her trying to find the song, The Devil's Nine Questions. Um, and in it, she talks about her and her partner, um, Carolyn Melbard, as 
two strange town women mounted on two rough farm horses. Um, so they're sort of seeing themselves as out of place um, on their endeavor. But when they get to the house, um, it sort of changes a little bit. They find a woman with a pet owl on her shoulder standing in the doorway. She's a sawmill cook who we knew for a singing woman. We told her of our quest and asked her to sing for us. And she says, I, I don't have any time. I have to get my dishes washed. And then Alfreda writes, my friend volunteered to wash them. So after many excuses, the old woman finally consented. <laughs> and so there's a little bit of strong arming here. But I also see um, you know, that there were strange town women going through the mountains. But af after they get into this house where this woman is, they're able to sort of um, I don't know, exchange domestic labor for song collecting and make a sort of connection there. Um, and what ends up happening is this woman sings um, The Devil's Nine Questions. This is Mary Lafon Martin um, of Giles County, Virginia. <laughs> Her name is Mary Lafon Martin. Um, and she sings The Devil's Nine Questions for Alfreda and Carolyn. <coughs> And Alfreda performed multiple roles, too. Like I said earlier, she was a singer as well. And we see evidence of that in the archive. Um, n there is the recording version, but there's also written evidence. Um, in the 1922 bulletin, they write that Miss Alfreda de Peel delighted the audience by singing to a pipe organ accompaniment. And this isn't the first time that she sang. There was actually some uh, meetings where she was absent. And then in the bulletin, they say, you know, the absence of Miss Alfreda Peel was noted by those who enjoyed her singing the year before. Um, and then in 1920, when the Colonial Dames of America wrote to Alfonso Smith um, asking for some music, he says, he suggests that they write to Miss Alfreda Peel and ask her to be present and sing some of the ballads she's found in Roanoke County. She sings these ballads very appealingly, and you'll get a better idea of song literature in colonial times in Virginia from her singing than from any music that I could send you. She also had a long-standing friendship um, and a working relationship with folk singer Texas Gladden. Um, the two met in 1916 when Alfreda did her first uh, ballad collecting trip for the Virginia Folklore Society. They met in 1916 and they continued their partnership um, up until Alfreda's death. Um, and Alfreda was um, a champion for Texas. She got her into um, the White Top Folk Festival on the year where um, Eleanor Roosevelt was president and Texas got to meet the First Lady. Um, and uh, she really advocated for, for Texas throughout her life. Um, and she also shared songs with Texas. Um, in 1932, uh, when the Virginia Folklore Society did their first recording trip, um, one of their stops was at the home of Miss Alfreda Peel in Salem, Virginia. And Alfreda had gathered a lot of ballad singers to her house, and she herself sang on the record. And so I'm going to play you some of her singing. And this is a digital recording. The University of Virginia recently got a clear grant um, to digitize the aluminum discs that are in the archive. So that's really exciting. Um, yeah, there's some tape, there's some tape transfers that the Library of Congress has, but now we've got digital transfers. Um, so this is Miss Elf this is Alfred of Peel singing Mary Leif on Martin's version of the Devil's Nine Questions. So I'm going to play a little bit of this. Let's do. This song is called The Devil and the Nine Questions, a version of the old English ballad of riddles widely expounded, sung by Miss Alfreda M. Peel of Salem, Roanoke County, Virginia. So when Alan Lomax came through Virginia in 1941, Alfreda pointed him to Texas Gladden. And he recorded Texas Gladden singing the same, the same tune. 
Um, the melody is slightly altered, but you can tell that it's the same one, and she attributes it to Alfreda at the end. So I'm going to start right about here. Um, and this is the Rounder Records version. Um, they actually cut the tape differently so that um, you hear the snippet of interview at the end of the song. So. So she's pretty clear on that. And so we can see the actual lineage, lineage from Miss Mary Leif on Martin to Alfreda Peel to Texas. And um, now that we've come back to the Library of Congress collection, I feel like that's a good, as good of a place as any to end. Um, so thanks for having me here. And thanks for letting me share some of the Virginia Folklore Society with you all. At the end of the panel. Yeah, I should have said that. I'm sorry. We're going to listen to all three of the papers and then, um, and then have questions. Our second speaker is Cheryl Kaskowitz, who um, I know from her research on Sidney Robertson that I have also done some of, and I'm really excited about the work she's doing. She's an independent scholar. She has a PhD from Harvard University, and she is currently working on a book about the New Deal, or the, the Resettlement Administration, New Deal era, um, about the, the two collectors, Margaret Valiant and Sidney Robertson, um, who collected for resettlement. Um, and she's doing amazing work on that, and I'm eager to see what she comes up with. Um, delighted to know she's working on that. Um, the name of her presentation is Government Song Women, Margaret Valiant, Sydney Robertson, and New Deal Collecting. Please welcome Cheryl. Thank you so much. I just want to say um, thank you to Nancy Gross and um, everyone else who was involved in this, putting this on. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, and also just thanks to everyone at um, the American Folklife Center. Um, I spent four months at the Library of Congress three years ago and sort of felt like they adopted me. Um, <laughs> and especially as an independent scholar, it's always nice to come back here and feel so welcome. So thank you. Um, let's see. OK, so uh, when we think about the arts and the Farm Security Administration, most people don't think about folk music. Uh, we think of the famous photographs by Dorothea Lang, Walker Evans, Gordon Parks, and many others who were sent out by the FSA's Information Division to document life during the Great Depression. And that was with the specific point of getting their, these out to the public. Um, to help people understand what, um, you know, some of the effects of the Great Depression. But back when the FSA was called the Resettlement Administration, it also had a music un unit that was hidden within a division called the Special Skills Division. And it quietly collected over 200 disc recordings, almost all of which are now held in the American Folklife Center. Um, in an oral history interview, Decades later, Adrian Dornbush, who is the director of the Special Skills Division and separate from the Information Division where the um, FSA photographers were coming from, but the, the oral history was really trying to, it was in the 60s and they were gathering, they were kind of rediscovering um, 
the the photographers and so the focus was really on the art and special skills um did all the graphic design for the resettlement um so that was the the focus of the oral history but what adrian dornbush ended up saying was that the um the unit's music collecting was, quote, the one tangible thing that we did in the special skills which has really lasted and boomed. So nearly all of these recordings were collected by two women, Sidney Robertson and Margaret Valiant. And I should just say that Sidney Robertson later became Sidney Robertson Cowell. And during her life, she insisted on being called Mrs. Cowell. Um, I'm going to refer to her as Sydney Robertson because that was her name at this time. And I've been working on this for so long that I'm, I actually feel like I'm on a first name basis with Sydney and Margaret. Um, so I hope th I, that isn't um, because I devalue their work in any way. I just can't really think about them in any other way. So I hope I don't offend anyone. Um, I'll call Charles Seeger Charlie also, if that helps. <laughs> um, so, um, and Sidney Robertson and Margaret Valiant's work is really not known. Um, I mean, thanks to Kathy, I think Sidney's work is more known now, um, but not this early collecting. And my sense is that a lot of people um, have seen that the resettlement administration of the New Deal collected folk music, um, but not really understood what that meant. Um, so part of what I've been looking at is really understanding why an agency called the Resettlement Administration was collecting folk music in the first place. Um, so um, just some background about the Resettlement Administration. Um, and th these are just some brochures that I found in my research. Uh, I'm a big fan of New Deal graphic design. So. Um, so the Resettlement Administration was basically a, an experimental agency that focused on helping thousands of people that were hardest hit by the Great Depression. So that was um, low-income farmers, um, tenant farmers, and sharecroppers, and also stranded workers like unemployed miners and urban workers whose jobs had disappeared. By resettling them on newly created homesteads, um, mostly in rural areas, also in some suburban areas like the Greenbelt towns. That might sound familiar to you. The Greenbelt was a resettlement uh, administration planned community. Um, and so these were across the country. And it was one of the New Deal's most radical and far-reaching and highly criticized programs, as you can imagine. If there was a backlash against the New Deal, this was the target. Um, and so it lasted just two years, from 1935 to 1937, when it was absorbed into the Department of Agriculture, and that's when it became the Farm Security Administration. So the Special Skills Division was created as a service division to create furniture and art and print materials for the Resettlement Administration, as well as to provide training and activities on the homestead. So originally, there hadn't actually been a plan for a music unit. They actually added it later. Um, I found some memos of um, someone going out and talking to the, ho to the homestead leaders about the fact that there was all this strife on the homesteads because people weren't getting along. Um, and, uh, the, and she said, what everyone said we need to deal with this emergency situation is music leaders, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> um, and so they created a music unit to meet that need. Um, and they hired um, Charles Seeger, Charlie, uh, who um, dispatched field representatives to the homesteads. They were m working mostly in the southeast. Um, and so these music representatives taught rudimentary music classes. They organized musical groups like symphonies and bands. Um, and they led community singing. And so in addition to leading these musical activities to meet this need, um, because it was Charlie Seeger, the music unit also recorded folk songs on the homesteads and in the surrounding communities. And the songs were then incorporated into the group singing to help strengthen community ties among the homesteaders. So he saw this direct connection between this uh, idea of a sort of authentic folk uh, music and helping to build community within these homesteads. 
and there's a lot more that I could say about resettlement, um, especially um, with some of the things um, Aldona talked about in terms of race and class. Um, but I want to get to the women, <laughs> so um, so we'll do that next. Okay, so this is Margaret Valiant. Um, Charlie hired her. They were friends from New York City, and she traveled down to Washington, D.C. with him and, um, and his family. She actually became friends with Ruth Crawford before um, Ruth and Charlie were married. And uh, so he hired her in January 1936 as one of the unit's first field representatives in music. And she was assigned to a new government homestead called Cherry Lake Farms in Madison County, Florida, where she led music activities and created theatrical pageants for its resettled residents. Um, and so collecting was really just a small part of what she was doing when she first came onto resettlement. She only collected a handful of recordings at Cherry Lake. Um, and she did the bulk of her collecting later. So after the resettlement administration had officially become part of the FSA in 1937, the music unit was basically shut down. Um, special skills became very, I mean, they, it, it was phased out, basically. And so everyone else was reassigned, except Margaret. And basically, under the radar, she continued to lead music activities on FSA homesteads without an actual music unit. Um, so she did that first in the southeast where the resettlement administration first worked, and then in Montana. She was called out to lead a pageant in Montana. And then finally in the FSA's migrant camps in California and Arizona. And this is where she took up recording in 1939, and she actually became the first collector to record songs in those migrant camps though her collections usually overlooked in favor of Todd and Sonkin's collecting, which happened the following year. And she also collected songs from communities in Arizona. And so overall, um, the collection in the American Folklife Center has 40 discs of uh, 136 songs. Um, so uh, I'll come back to this if I have time. <laughs> but the. Uh, after she left the FSA, she was hired by the National Youth Administration and ran um, as the music director. Um, and she kept her recording machine. And so we have some recordings that she did um, of African American uh, students in Georgia. Uh, there are more, and I'm still looking for them. So I should just say, in general, um, there is a lot more information out there about Sydney. And so um, Margaret is, that is kind of, I'm still piecing together some of the mysteries about her. Um, so uh, Sydney Robertson, as I said, later became Sydney Robertson Cowell. Um, she joined the RA's music unit six months, about in July 1936. Um, and she was originally hired as uh, Charlie's music assistant. And apparently she says that he always really wanted her to stay in the office and help him um, in DC, um, but that she really wanted to be out in the field. And so there was this tension about her job. But um, over the course of her tenure, she became the unit's most prolific music collector. As you can see, um, she collected 658 tracks um, in 10 states. Um, and. Um, and so when she returned from her big two-month solo collecting trip at the end of 1936, she returned in January 1937, she discovered that the RA's music unit would soon be no more. And she was reassigned to a, um, a position at a homestead in rural Minnesota that was not music-based. Um, but she actually held on to the unit's equipment. And that is where, and so out in her spare time, she was on a homestead. She was responsible for things like the canning club and the baseball team and all of these logistical things that were happening on this homestead in rural Minnesota. And then in her spare time, she would go out to these communities um, in the upper Midwest. Um, and so sh she became the first to record um, in the ethnic enclaves of um, Wisconsin and Minnesota, um, and also the, the lumber um, the lumber towns there. Um, and Alan Lomax would follow in 1938. Um, so she is mo best known for her collecting 
that happened after, starting in 1938. Um, but she did have this rich collecting um, that happened as part of the resettlement administration. Um, sorry, so before I go into more detail about the songs, because I do want to play some of the songs, um, I just want to talk a bit more about what the Resettlement Administration was doing collecting music in the first place. I think when a lot of people hear, okay, this came from some New Deal, deal agency, there's an assumption that it's related to the WPA somehow, because the WPA is who did most of the collecting during the New Deal. And that was a, uh, a job creating um, agency. And so a lot of the underneath, um, obviously there was an interest in documenting American folk culture, but there was also an interest in creating jobs for white collar workers. But the RA, I mean, you know now what the Resettlement Administration was for, um, and a little bit about why they were collecting music, which to, to really serve this specific social use. Um, so, um, but what's important to know about the RA is that um, it had a larger goal, which is part of what made it radical in looking at it now, um, that they called cooperative education, where they hoped to foster an ideological shift on the homesteads away from rugged individualism to an emphasis on community and collective responsibility. And this was, um, uh, th the director, Rexford G. Tugwell, um, uh, who was known as Red the Rex the Red, um, was very, um, he was open about this. Um, so homes on the homesteads were built in close enough proximity to encourage people to cooperate, think of themselves as a community, recreation programs and community halls were planned. Um, and so th these were done intentionally and the music unit was deeply intertwined with the cooperative values. Um, and so Charlie wrote that his unit's main concern should be, quote, to regard music as a social function, to direct it towards certain definite social goals as an activity of masses of people rather than merely of isolated individuals. Uh, and so Charlie felt that the best way to use music to help um, you know, define a collective was to collect this authentic folk music of the people. And there's lots of things to discuss about, you know, their vision of what that was and who was included and who was excluded um, that I will be talking about in my book when it comes out, whenever that is. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, so it's important to understand the resettlement administration and the context that the collection takes place. I think it helps if you go to listen to the, to the music to understand that um, it had this other purpose that was different um, from other collection um, endeavors. Um, so I just want to talk about how, you know, some specific ways that it shaped Margaret and Sydney's um, collecting. Um, first of all, um, you can imagine that conservatives might not like this idea that the government was using music to encourage people to think of themselves as a collective. Uh, and uh, so the music unit was very much kept on the DL. Um, many of their memos are marked confidential. In fact, Charles Seeger got in trouble. There was a, for using that confidential um, marking so many of them confidential because none of them had the clearances for official confidential, um, uh, you know, to, to look at government, confidential government documents. Um, and um, if you look at the annual report and you look at special skills, it, it does not mention the music unit's activities. I think the word music is included in, in a list of things that it does. Um, and um, there really wasn't anything in the press about um, special skills in general, um, but specifically about music. So this was one, a newspaper article that was rare um, that described Sydney's um, collecting in the Ozarks. And um, so in that second paragraph, you'll see it says, 
Asked what relation there is between resettlement and collecting old ballots, Mrs. Robertson said she wouldn't dream of explaining it. <laughs> Explained she is definitely instructed not to discuss the program. <laughs> Um, so unlike the FSA's photographs, which were very much public facing, um, the folk music collecting was, was intentionally kept under the radar. And that's one of the reasons I think that um, we don't know as much about it um, today. Or s maybe some of you know about it, but most people don't. <laughs> um, so the other thing that I find interesting is that the music unit had a particular interest in labor union protest songs which they viewed as a successful model of music being put to a social use in this way, um, and in the way that they were hoping to do. And so both Sydney and Margaret collected these protest songs, and um, they're in the collections. So Sydney um, was very careful to cover her tracks when recording these protest songs. As you saw, she, was, she took this mandate to keep things on the down low uh, seriously. Um, she usually wrote extremely long, detailed, often funny um, field reports back to the office. Um, but the labor union songs um, did not appear on those field reports. So the first one that she did um, was at a homestead called Cumberland Homestead in Tennessee. And she set up a recording session with the Garrett family. And so this, I don't know if you can see that, is what the report looked like. Um, she sent these back um, to Adrian Dornbush from all of her. So, so for Sydney, we have this incredible documentation and about the context of the recordings. This isn't true for Margaret, unfortunately. Um, but if you looked care, if you could see this, <laughs> you would see that uh, it doesn't say anything about any protest songs. Um, what she did was she wrote a confidential report later uh, where she said, I won't again try to combine recording of labor and more orthodox songs in the same locality. It is too difficult to manage. But I think my tracks were kept fairly clear, and the songs are good. So, um, so we can listen to this excerpt, um, Strike at Harem in Tennessee. And this is a song that Mike Seeger actually recorded later on. Um, and um, the words are recounting a recent strike at a local mill. So on the same collecting trip, Sydney also made a special trip to St. Louis, um, which, where she collected protest songs that had been sung during a citywide strike that protested the city cutting its relief rolls. So just as in Tennessee, there's no official report describing her activities in St. Louis. So for me, I knew that she went there. She talked in correspondence about going there. And then when I looked through all of her field reports, there was nothing. And it wasn't, and um, what she did, a confidential memo that was going to end up with her field reports was too public for this, um, maybe because the actual Communist Party was involved in these protests. Um, so Sydney wrote a personal letter to Special Skills Director Adrian Dornbush, and then she mailed it to the home of a different Special Skills staff person. <laughs> just to be safe. And so this letter was sort of hidden among some of her correspondence in a different place in the American Folk Life Center. So um, I felt like I had won the lottery when I found it. <laughs> um, so she recorded four full discs in St. Louis, about 15 different songs. Um, and they were sung by a multiracial group of activists who sort of arrived throughout the day. And she loved um, you know, she describing the th kinds of things they talked about and, um, you know, the things that they were drinking and it sounded like a very good time. So um, here's one song 
that she said was um, popular among the girls in the Garment Workers Union and other central trades. And it's sung to the tune of Rockabye Baby. And she included the words um, in her letter to Dornbush. And she wrote, quote, sing it over once to that naive lilting tune and see if you don't think that's a beauty. The girls adore and are perfectly aware of the light irony and the contrast between the bitter words and the childlike tune. So later, um, for Margaret at the FSA camps, I know, <laughs> um, <laughs> Margaret was much more open about her collection of labor protest songs, and perhaps because she was working with very little oversight, um, she didn't have a direct supervisor. She seemed to be reporting directly to a division head. Um, and so they probably didn't have time to read any of her specific information. But anyway, so there's a lot more that I need to uh, find out about the context of her collecting. But um, she recorded this version of Going Down the Road Feeling Bad at Camp Shafter in March 1939, which was one of the um, FSA camps. And so in contrast to Sydney's extreme efforts to keep her protest collecting confidential, Margaret actually included these lyrics in a compilation of song lyrics that she put together and, um, and sent out to, um, I'm still, again, trying to understand the, um, the arrangement that, but I did find this in, um, in someone's uh, collection at the FDR library. So I know it got out there. Um, but, um, so it starts in the middle, the song starts in the middle of the refrain before moving on to the protest lyrics, but maybe I don't have time. How much time do I have? About 10 minutes. Okay. Um, well. Okay. In the interest of time, we can go back and listen. But you can see the, um, you know, the, it ends with uh, we had to organize and um, come and join the CIO, um, which was a big deal. Um, the the planters in California were strongly opposed to what the FSA camps were doing, um, and so the fact that she was willing to show this support tacit support for the CIO. Um, if she had had, a, if this had gotten out there, it, it actually probably would have gotten the FSA into some trouble. Um, so there's a few important differences in Sydney and Margaret's experiences that I, I think stem partly from their different roles within the FA, RA and FSA. Um, so Sydney's job at the RA was always focused on recording, and I think that that kind of laid the foundation um, for her later work. Um, and her work in the Washington office also included meetings with technicians from the Presto Recording Company. And so she got detailed instructions about how to operate the equipment. And before her own collecting, she was sent on an apprenticing trip in North Carolina with these two men, John Lomax and Duke Professor Frank Brown. Um, where she was able to um, get more comfortable using the recording equipment and talk to these men about their experience. And, um, and I just, after the trip, Charles wrote to one of his supervisors, quote, her experience with the two collectors reveals a flair for diplomacy, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> I don't know what that means, <laughs> uh, but one can imagine. So, um, 
So this trip also began Sydney's development of her own recording methodology, which focused on putting her subjects at ease. Um, and um, and so she, as she wrote, the, the collector's visit to make records should be a social occasion, never a business one. Anything like a crisp business-like manner smacks of the city and will, be t and will defeat one's end. So that connects to that idea of these townswomen um, and the, this issue of class that comes up um, with um, someone like Sydney coming out to record. Um, so I might not have time to play this, but one of the ways this came up was um, Sydney uh, collected from Emma Dusenberry, who some of you may know. She was sort of um, well known as uh, kind of legendary for the astonishing number of songs um, and range of songs that she knew. And John Lomax had gone to see her and recorded some songs. And um, apparently, according to Sydney, um, Mrs. Dusenberry sent him away because she found him rude. <laughs> um, and so when Sydney went, she um, had been cultivating this sort of um, warmer connection with um, with her uh, with her subjects. Um, and um, also, Mrs. Dusenberry sung several songs that she said were for girls only um, for Sydney. So that also shows, you know, what women collectors, um, you know, a, a, that they could have a different approach. Um, so I'm just going to play the very beginning of this um, because um, if you listen to these Dusenberry recordings, so that they kind of chat in between. And um, anyway, um, this we'll just listen. <laughs> They're just laughing. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, all of these are available to listen to um, in the archive. <laughs> um, so Margaret um, also prized the personal connection with the people she recorded. Um, and uh, Ralph Rinsler and Kate Rinsler actually interviewed her in the 1970s um, from the and um, and she talked about, she said, I began to learn the trick of getting people to sing because I would take my guitar and I would strum a little. And that breaks down the reserves, and they would see that I was modest about it and honest about it. And then they would say, oh, my granddaddy used to sing such and such. Um, and Margaret really had no training in folklore. Um, she didn't have any. So some of her um, songs, sh she's obviously accompanying um, the people, either on the guitar or the piano. Um, so um, but unlike Sydney. Margaret never received any training on the recording equipment. And so she recorded very little in her early work at the Resettlement Administration. And Sidney later said that Margaret didn't make many recordings for the RA because, quote, she was a little afraid of the machine. And, um, she, and Sidney said that Margaret needed an assistant who wasn't always available to run it. Um, so I can talk more about this difference between them and their personalities and things like that uh, if, if people have questions about it. Um, so when Margaret joined the FSA, um, they gave her a different recording machine to record in Arizona and California, um, but she still didn't receive any training on it. And so I was amazed to stumble upon this track hidden among her recordings, um, where she was talking with two men about her trouble with the recording equipment, and they recorded it as a test. Um, so you're going to hear her voice, and at the beginning she had just mentioned the fact that the needles on the recording equipment produce fuzz, and that she had to figure out for herself that she needed to use a little brush to remove it from the record. So here she is. But now, isn't that clear? I had to figure that out myself. Nobody told me what to do about this fuzz, and I went crazy right in the middle of the Anyone out there that knew how to do Nobody it? Nobody knows. Not even the anybody anyway. You get radio men and electricians, they never saw them. And they fooled around and experimented like I did. What a it is. And this was. You don't have to do it all the time. You see the right in front of yourself, part of the time. But how are you going to tell? Well, and suddenly right you're, uh, you're recording a record, and all of a sudden this gets snowed up inside that door. But I assure you, it did. It doesn't. It doesn't. Every once in a while, I'll have a pile of nice here and get a good pile. But all of a sudden you 
turn around to look at the singer and see if he's about to get through, well, and you look back and it's caught up on the needle of you. That's a trick. I thought it'd be good for six months. Why I got that impression, I don't know. I'm so happy that I could play that for people who would appreciate it. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to say about it, um, uh, you know, other than the mansplaining as an art form. Um, and, you know, it may also show that Margaret was focused on the performers more than the, the, um, re the equipment. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that she started out as this music representative who was working with the people. And I think she always saw the recording as an outgrowth of that. Um, more than an interest in the product, if that makes sense. How am I doing? Oh, okay. All right. Um, okay, so I, d I did just want to, I can go through this very quickly, because there are some other things about Margaret's collection, that, because I don't think people really know very much about it. Um, and she had a knack for recording talented musicians who would go on to be famous. And so there are a couple of those that I thought, that I feel like some people might be excited about. Um, so the first is Russell um, Chubby Wise, who's a fiddler. Um, he played with Bill Monroe's Bluegrass Boys in 1942, and later with the Grand Ole Opry, and he was inducted into the Fiddler Hall of Fame. But sh uh, she recorded him at Cherry Lake in 1936, um, and so he was in his early 20s. Um, he hadn't been playing with a band, apparently. His bio says he was living in Jacksonville um, and working as a cab driver and playing in clubs, clubs at night, and I'm, I'm still trying to understand what brought him to um, Cherry Lake. Um, but anyway, we probably don't have time to listen. You can just get a sense that when you come across these, and if you've listened to the, you know, the amateur fiddlers, um, and there are a lot of them, uh, and then you come across something like this, it's clear that there's something different going on. Okay, so there's about, there's a whole, um, there's maybe eight tracks of him playing. Um, so the second artist um, that she recorded, um, which had nothing to do with the FSA um, uh, migrant camps, but it was while she was out in Arizona, and she recorded Lalo Guerrero, who's now known as the father of Chicano music, um, and uh, she recorded his guitar quartet, uh, Los Carlistas. This photo was in a, c a, a collection of her photographs. Um, and that um, I can talk more about that photographed on the patio of Margaret Sanger. Um, Margaret Valiant led a crazy life, is all I can say. Um, so anyway, um, so I don't know the circumstances of why she decided to record these songs. She did talk about including these songs of Mexican Americans. They were included in her compilation to say that they, um, you know, that, um, I, I, I wish that I had the quote, but it, it was it was something that like that their um, their in any case she saw them as part of what she was collecting, which was a big deal at the time, and not to excuse some of the other problems that um, of inclusion and exclusion uh, in these collections. But anyway, um, so um, Los Carlis, sorry, this. Um, they had already found some fame at this point. Um, they had appeared in a Gene Autry film called Boots and Saddles, so they were unattributed, and they made their first commercial recording in summer 1938. Um, but from my early research, the songs in Margaret's collection weren't commercially recorded. Um, so I can just play you a little of that. Okay, sorry. Anyway, there's a lot of um, songs by them. There's probably five scattered across a couple of different collections. Um, how am I doing? Zero time? Yes. Zero time. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I just, um, I will just quickly say that um, uh, this, um, 
is part of, I think, this, there's a growing trend of kind of uncovering women's um, un, uh, unacknowledged work. There's lots of books right now about that. And so I, I kind of see this as part of that and maybe, you know, folk music's version of, you know, Code Girls and Rocket Girls and all of these books that are talking about this kind of hidden work of women. Um, and so um, at the end of their life, both Margaret Valiant and Sidney Robertson kind of talked about um, um, their, you know, looking back and, and acknowledging that they were unacknowledged. Um, so um, I don't have time to read this whole thing, um, but, um, you know, she says, you know, it was made clear to me that I got minimum pay for maximum effort and he got maximum pay plus credit title. Um, what I've accomplished is this, I've survived. I've survived the vanitas vanitatum of the guys who took credit and pay for my achievements. And Sydney said something similarly, specifically about her experience at the RA, and not to, you know, throw Charlie Seeker under the bus. Um, but, uh, you know, she said that, um, he, this quote at the end, he never did realize that there was any difference between thinking up the idea of recording and doing the actual work. So, thank you. <laughs> And our third speaker is Ann Hoog, Folklife Specialist in the American Folklife Center. Um, she's worked here at the Library of Congress since 1998 and has worked in many capacities as reference librarian, as coordinator of processing. She's done many presentations. She knows the collections very well. And um, she has recently been the coordinator of a project to put a lot of the Folklife Center's historic field projects online. The Folklife Center used to do field projects. Um, and she holds an MA from in American Studies um, with a concentration in folklife from George Washington University. She will be speaking about women and the American Folklife Center archive. Welcome, Anne. Good morning. Um, so the topic is women in the American Folklife Center Archive. It's not a broad topic at all. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm standing in for my, um, my, my supervisor, Nikki Saylor, who's the head of the archive. She couldn't be here today to uh, go on an important acquisitions trip. Um, so I'm, I'm standing here in, in her place. Um, so um, I've had a few days <laughs> to put this together, um, but it's been really, um, uh, even though it was put, put together very quickly, it's been a real joy to work on. Um, Kathy mentioned the, the field projects, which is going to be a lot of what I'm going to be talking about um, talking about today. Um, so when I first started thinking about, oh, I just want to point out this photograph. <laughs> um, I just I came across that's one of the field projects, Chicago Ethnic Arts Project, and it was right at the beginning of the project when there was nothing on the wall behind them. As they went <laughs> further in the project, there were like pictures and brochures and maps and all this kind of stuff. So it's a really interesting point in time here, the very beginning, April 1977, the very beginning of these field projects. Um, but I'll talk more about that a little bit later. Uh, when I first started thinking about how to approach this topic of women in the American Folklife Center archive, I first tried to think about how to present the information, whether to go chronological and to talk about the earliest documentation in the archive, uh, including those made by, of course, Alice Fletcher, Helen Roberts, Francis Densmore, among many, many others, um, who made, uh, all made recordings um, of songs and narratives of numerous American Indian nations and other traditional music in the early 20th century. Uh, and to continue with the chronology, to move on to the mighty disc era of Ruby Lomax, Helen Hartness Flanders, and Sidney Roberts and Cowell. Or, you know, to make a list, and I, I think some of this list, thanks to Nancy Gross for comp compiling this list, um, which goes on for a couple pages here. This is just a list of <laughs> some of some of the contributors to materials 
in the collection. But how do you do this without sounding like a freight train racing through our collections with lists of names, dates, and locations, or a folklorist version of we didn't start the fire? <laughs> uh, it was interesting to even think about how you start to compile a list like this, because you have to look not only at the collections where the names are prominently in the collection title, like the Vita Chenoweth collection or the Roxanne Connick Carlisle collection, but also to look at the contributors to collections that don't appear in the titles. As many of you are uh, probably aware, a team of us at the Library of Congress have been working for several years to get the AFC Regional Field Project surveys um, from the 1970s through the 1990s online. Photos once only viewable through tiny color slides with a light table and a contact sheet with a loop are now digitized and becoming available online. Free to listen to, view, and download, um, plus the searchable metadata that includes names, places, dates, cross-references to both creators of the content and, most often, uh, and often those depicted. With so much content in one place, um, this seemed like a good place to start. This is the South Central Georgia team with uh, Beverly Robinson there up front. A good place to start to uncover the tens of thousands of photographs, hundreds of hours of sound recordings, and thousands of pages of field notes, logs, and field reports on wide-ranging topics from religious expression, occupational folk life, textiles, crafts, music, dance, folk medicine, and endless number of other topics. And to focus on those materials uh, documented by the women field workers involved not only as photographers, recordists, and interviewers, but also as the project planners, field coordinators, and contributors to these projects that have for decades served as a national model of field work and documentation. I'm going to mostly, in this presentation, let the collections do the speaking. Um, so I'm going to be showing a lot of photos, uh, many of which haven't, we haven't seen grouped together like this in one place. So I'm going to pause for a few seconds on, on each of these photos just to absorb it. Um, I also have three or four audio samples to kind of let the faces and voices here tell the story in this room rather than have me ramble on and merely describe them for you. One of the great strengths of these field projects is the reflexive nature where not only was the camera turned on the community traditions being documented, but also on the documentation process itself. As a result, we have a rich collection not only of the regional communities being studied, but the communities of the field workers, photos of them doing their work with their tools. There's a couple pictures with cameras. Lintha Eiler is a contributor to many, many field projects. Lintha Eiler. Oh, Lintha Eiler. again, it's a, um, checking the light on the Blue Ridge light meter. And then there are a number of pictures with recording devices and the contexts and the various locations where recordings are taking place that really capture that context and the relationships that are built during field work, such as the many recordings done outside. In doorways. Literally, there's like so many photos of people standing next to a door or <laughs> in doorways. You gotta <laughs> think about, you know how sometimes you think the interview is over and you're leaving and then you realize it's still going? I, I don't know, it's like the entering and exiting of the, of the interview. And of course, in uh, people's homes, um, such as kitchens and dining rooms. Uh, living rooms. Okay. 
and places of business, lots of occupational folk life and places of business. And of, you know, so often you see the recording device there in the picture. It wasn't just the picture of the interview taking place, it's also the, 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 the tools being used. Interviews done in cars. Um, this Carl was sitting in the back seat running the tape recorder, Carl Fleischauer. He was running the tape recorder. And you, when you listen to this recording, I mean, you can hear the, the car driving along the road. Uh, They're going over bumps. The car seats are squeaking <laughs> up and down. You hear a little voice from the, her. Uh, this is uh, Miss Etta Anderson, her granddaughter, speaking up sometimes. It was really just, you know, this, this they, they were driving out to, um, where she'd been growing some, some medicinal herbs, um, where they ended up documenting that, but also documenting the, the transit from her home out, out there was, was fascinating. This is from Chicago, out on uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, and at various events, um, uh, which were documented throughout these these field projects, um, parades. Here, here we have the Milk River Train. This is Kay Young participating in the Milk River Train in Montana, um, which was about a five-day journey um, to experience the wagon train as pioneers once did. Um <coughs> and it ended um, on Labor Day in, in Malta, Montana. But she took part in this um, in this project. And later on, there's an audio clip of her talking a little bit about this experience. Of course, front porches. There's a lot of pictures on front porches. I love this picture. It really, I hadn't seen that one before. And of course, in workshops. So here's a audio sample I'm, I'm going to play just to kind of bring some life to, to, to some of these photos. This is Paula Johnson in the Montana Folklife Survey. Um, talking with, uh, with a couple of wheelwrights. Um, this was done in the, in the evening. You can hear crickets chirping in the background. They're sanding the wood. Um, and I just think that this is a, a, a good example of um, occupational folklore documentation and the types of probing questions a, a field worker has, and a good example of, of how to do an interview a lot of times, whereas a field worker, you, you know a little bit, but you don't know a lot. You're still asking these, these questions. Um, and in the background, you're also going to hear a lot of clicking and at first I was trying to figure out what it was um, and it's the photographer that's there it's actually Michael Crummett taking pictures <laughs> so again documenting our own our own process in there you know, I just want to play this hmm. so for this wagon you have 40 inch wheels on front and 48 on the back 44, 44. It's usually yeah. four inches difference in the wheels from the front right. and back for a buggy. What yeah. about for wagons? Are they the same size? Uh, or? No, they're all they're different. All. Huh. Like one company would have made, say, like a, a 50 inch wheel in the back and a, and a uh, 46 wheel in front or a 47 wheel or a 45. Or just, yeah, there's no, there's no pattern to pattern. it that we run on to anyway, you know. But by experience we've had with them, they're just, they're just. Well, 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 I think your stage coaches. You know, they're, their wheels are big. Must have been oh. real big, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. See, the yeah. bigger yeah. wheel, easier to roll. Faster and the bigger yeah. roll you can put on. And, uh, and but the harder more. it is to make the wheel. Right. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 You get like that one spoke that it shows you out of a wagon. Yeah. And then there's some bigger than that yet, too. But then their wheels are not <coughs> more gentle than fours. Or that your, your wagon wheels are in twos, your fillies, and your wagon wheels are in fours. What do you mean so by fillies? This is what we call a fillie. Oh, okay. The, but the rim, that's what I've been calling yeah, the rim. Yeah, that's what I've been calling the rim. The iron. Is that what you, you all call it fillies? Yeah, this is a fillie. Okay. Fillie than your iron rim on there. Iron rim, okay. But they, in wagons, they put them in fours. Huh. Or sometimes they even like this, it just depends because they're so hard you can't. Like you can't get pulling one. on this and bending them and pulling them, it's, yeah. it's a lot harder to do. Huh. So. You've been mainly doing buggies though, right? Yeah. No stagecoaches no, yet? No. 
<laughs> We'd like to get one. We'd like yeah. to get a hold of one. That's funny. Oh. Mainly for oh, yeah. Yeah. just for ourselves and have it here and put it, Whoa. And put it uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, place and have it on it. So if you ever wanted to know what a camera sounded like in 1979, you know, it was um, interesting. Um, but this, you know, it, it's so hard to just find little clips of, of, of interviews. I just, you know, when you want to play the whole, the whole interview, that, that there, I mean, they, they talked for an hour or two hours. There's a part one and two to this interview. It's, it's really fascinating. And of course, no fieldwork venture would be complete without going to music venues. Um, so, you know, these weren't recordings um, that were, you know, brought back here to the library and made in the studio. It is, you know, much in the tradition of like what we were hearing with um, Sidney Robertson and, and Margaret Valiant and going out and, and making these recordings in the context where they exist. So this was just kind of a, a fun um, thing I just wanted to play for a minute. Um, she interviewed Jimmy Walker as well about boogie woogie piano playing in Chicago. But then she, several days later, she went back and recorded him playing. <laughs> It also just exemplifies the importance of knowing how to use your equipment and make a good quality recording. Um, that was that was really really great. Um, and clearly, Jonas Dovidanis was there taking pictures as well. I think that was the day that this this picture was taken. So, beyond the the, the field work it itself, um, also documented were was the speaking of the communities of field workers, is the settings where planning and directing projects was happening. Uh, this is Greta Swenson, who was the field coordinator of the Chicago Ethnic Arts Project, with um, Alan Jabor, who was the then newly appointed and first director of, of the AFC. And this was, you know, again, this picture was, was uh, <laughs> see, there's stuff on the wall now. Um, so this was probably more like May or June 19, 1977, but that's the same desk where that first black and white picture was. Um, I think capturing some of the dynamics in some of these pictures is kind of interesting. Um, they're kind of looking at each other with tight lips <laughs> at that moment. Not not sure what they were they were talking about, but there was a lot of um, coordinating to be to be going on at the time. And speaking of of planning, um, this is a photo of Geraldine Johnson taken um, at a planning meeting um, for the Blue Ridge Parkway project, and it was kind of a midterm planning meeting where they were reflecting back on some of the things they had found and thinking ahead to some of the stuff they still wanted to find. And because we have such rich documentation in these field projects of Jerry Johnson's interviews with quilters, um, in fact, it was one of the first American memory collections back when we were putting collections back online in the um, late 90s, early 2000s, the Quilts and Quilt Making in America collection was one of those early ones that, that went online that included a number of these interviews that she did for the Blue Ridge Parkway project. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to play this because so often, you know, we've heard her interviews with quilters and her field work. I, I don't know that I've ever heard her sort of going on in like a planning meeting about what her, what her approach was and how she was, how she was doing this field work. Um, the sound quality on this, just to warn you, was a little bit um, tricky to deal with because it was uh, recorded at a, at a meeting and I think there were like two mics put in the middle of a table. Um, and so uh, I've tried to um, bump up the sound a little bit. Um, so maybe if you close your eyes and listen, but I'll play it as long as we can tolerate the, <laughs> tolerate it. Uh, the quilting tradition is something that I found to be very rich and very interesting to me. 
here um, as it is actually performed in the area. I'm interested in everything that has to do with quilting that exists in the area. Now it seems to me, from the little research I've done with quilting, the two kinds of studies have predominated. One, the examination of museum pieces, uh, your finest quilt from there. And secondly, the examination of the very quaint uh, quilting bees, as they're called. Uh, the latter quilting groups don't seem to me to be very prevalent in this, in this area. I'm not nearly as active as I have thought. And again, I know all sorts of th assumptions as to why this might be. One is, I guess everybody knows that any quilt made in a quilting group is inferior, and therefore nobody wants them, so nobody quilts that way. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one assumption that I might throw out. And then other reasons, perhaps the churches, which are frequently the center of this kind of quilting activity, don't have maybe the social organization or the space available or whatever to provide this kind of this kind of ongoing activity. I'm just throwing these ideas out. I expect somebody to jump on me. <laughs> anyway, the cool thing about quilts that interests me are the piecing, first of all, some seem to be um, hand pieced, some seem to be machine pieced. I'm curious as to whether there's one type prevalent for the market, one type prevalent for home use. Uh, I'm interested in the relative use of what I call plain quilt and fancy quilt. Are some made only for family, are some made only for uh, for sale? I don't know, but I'd like to investigate that, that relationship. The applique quilt, it seems to me, that I found are, are not traditional, and on any traditional applique patterns yet, but only those that are bought from kits and then uh, quilted applique and quilted for family members or for sale. And generally not for use. In other words, they're a special kind of quilt bought in a kit, quilted and given to some special member or sold for a fantastic price. Uh, I was particularly interested in the uh, in the quilting patterns, and I think I've been to everybody's ear about that. The quilting patterns themselves, and the, the fan type quilting seems to be very prevalent here, and I haven't seen it in other places. And that's the, the fan that is drawn on. About the, the stitching pattern of that. Yeah, the stitching pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm quite interested in the way that it's done. A piece of chalk attached to a string, and then the fan drawn on. And, uh, I was told that the fan should consist of at least five lines, or five lines precisely. I hadn't been able to verify that. Uh, but that seems to be a very old quilting pattern tradition in this area. And in fact, I was told there are only two ways to quilt quilt. You either quilt it by the fan or by the piece. <laughs> and, uh, so I've also heard reporting that there are only two, two ways of quilting, by the fan or by the piece. It's kind of interesting hearing her reflect on that and then knowing, you know, in retrospect that she went on and, and just, you know, found some of the things that, that she was looking for that she hadn't quite found at, at this point. So it's, it's really interesting hearing the, the process of that. Um, so here's just a series of portraits of field workers um, exemplifying um, just some of these things we've been talking about, some of them um, at meetings. Um, this is Margaret Owen at that same meeting. Um, and I just, I just like these pictures. I just wanted to share them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's again, Jerry Johnson. She was involved in many field projects. Rhode Island, this was a planning meeting for a Rhode Island folk life project. Kay Young. And again, a lot of these pictures were at planning meetings. Chicago Ethnic Arts. Um, so this is um, sort of getting getting near the end and Ken wanted to kind of wrap up on um, some reflections. This is a team meeting of the Montana Folk Life team. Um, a good you know, reflection on field work that they had done, so the project was over at this point. Um, and again, the, the sound quality is a little challenging. I mean, you can see, see sort of way over on the left is where the mic stand was, and so you can very clearly hear, that's Barry Tolkien up there on the, on the left. 
very clearly hear him, and he talks a lot. Um, he talks a lot. I mean, he was the project director. Um, but, you know, the other three are, are in the room, but they're a little bit harder to hear. So, um, you know, basically what they're talking about here is some of the um, Kay Young and Paula Johnson talking about some of their frustrations about not having documented enough uh, women's um, folk life in the Montana project. So I just want to play a little bit of this. What about uh, one of the things that kept cropping up as we went around the state was the rather prominent role of women in, in, a, in a central way in a lot of the traditions. There was the, the feeling that you ran across the, the idea that, that a woman had invented or had developed this particular beaver slide. Um, uh, I can't remember there are other examples now, but I remember being struck by well, women were involved in the haying, uh, things that seemed to not fit the, uh, the easy stereotype of the masculine West. And I just wondered, did we get far enough with any of our stuff to be able to make anything on that, did we? I'm disappointed that we didn't get to talk to more women. Yeah. And I felt that on the wagon train, too. Uh -huh. Were there many women on the wagon train? Oh, sure. Yeah. But it was very difficult to find a way to talk to them. Yeah. They were busy or uh -huh. doing something on. So well, maybe that way. says something, yeah in itself that the women were busy and had responsibilities just like they do on ranches and uh, they get out and take the reins of wagons they're out mowing the hay as well as all the household responsibilities it seems like in some cases the women have actually more responsibilities than the men because they they have the household chores which men very rarely get involved in, but also they're out there helping the men with their chores. Now, this is an across-the-board statement, I don't think, but uh, it is definitely <laughs> something that should be pursued later on and that we did not adequately get uh, good coverage on. I, I think, you know, there's such a big dearth of information about women's folklore generally in the country, and I've always thought it's partly because most of the folklore... Gary, is Gary Stanton. Is certainly not all of them. And a lot of times people don't just know what questions to ask. But I just wonder if there are other situational things, too, like maybe being doubly busy or... But in Butte, the women in Butte weren't particularly... I mean, they weren't working in the mines as well as the homes, but it was still very difficult to contact her. We talked to a lot of women, though. We do know we wish we could have talked to more. We did talk to a lot of women. And I'm just wondering if maybe the reason we feel a little dissatisfied with the collecting it has to do with the fact that many of the men we interviewed were performing, or performing like Kevin Shannon, mm -hmm. or you know, doing things that were readily recognizable as traditional. And maybe if we would have had more time to spend with one woman and go back for repeated visits, um, we would have been able to yeah. get more. The women's stuff that we got most readily was the stuff that we had already identified, like like quilt making, for example. Cooking. Cooking. Uh, the women seemed in some of the homes we were in, uh, well, when we were in Kevin Shannon's home, the wife was uh, obviously talkative and full of information and attitude, but had subordinated herself to being hostess in a way because our focus was all on Kevin, so we, we might have found out a lot from her, more than we did. But in other places like that old Japanese woman, apparently, is the kingpin of the family. And, uh, and so she was talking more than anybody else on that table. I'm remembering Red Hans that we went out to see yeah. him, and by my seeking the wife, we found out that she quilted and yeah. crocheted and yeah. did all kinds of things yeah. too. And I'm awfully glad you asked her because in the, in our stumbling around the yard, admiring all the whirly gigs, um, I mean that was that's what we went there for too. But on the other hand, it, it seemed to me that she was a very sensitive woman who might have. I don't think she would have brought it up. No, she wouldn't have. No, but she, I'm trying to think. She wouldn't have been petulant about it, but she might have been a bit hurt because she's also obviously quite a, an artist. And if we hadn't asked at all, yeah, I if we spent the whole day paying attention to her, husband, yeah. she didn't look like she'd be small minded about it. No. But it, would, it would have been small of us not to have seen See. that stuff. And we, you know, and, uh, I just wonder how many things like that we, that we just caught partly because we went to see somebody else. Uh, that's happened not between sexes all the way through, it happened in the state prison as well, but we tripped over something because we had to see something else. But I, 
I sense that, that, that women's folklore is a lot more basic to what's going on in Montana, or the folklore that women are involved in, than we've been able really to probe very deeply. So I had to just play that whole clip. That, and there's really interesting part at the beginning, too, where he talks about, well, maybe, you know, Barry Tolkien says, well, maybe it's because there are more men folklorists than women, and they, they have that discussion as well. So it's interesting. Um, so I just wanted to um, um, end with, with this slide, because when the field work is over, you have to come back to create those logs and field notes and create order. Out of, out of what you just created. Um, and I just want to say one major piece of documentation missing here, because I didn't quite have enough time to pull together, um, is to look at the field notes. The field notes are also online. And the field notes is where you can really get into some of the deeper thoughts uh, that um, some of these uh, field workers were having about their day-to-day -day situations and where they were and some of the challenges they were dealing with. So that's definitely an, an area to explore further and dive into the collections. Um, and there's so much more to learn about uh, the women in these collections in the archive, so please come visit us and learn more. That's it. Thank you, Anne. Um, if the three speakers could come up, um, this was a great session. Wow, exciting. Um, And um, I'll ask a question uh, to start us off. It's really wonderful to see the photographs of the women doing field work. Um, I think for many of us, nobody was there taking a picture of us doing field work. We don't even have a documentation. And for women in previous eras, you certainly don't have that sort of images of women often engaged in doing field work. So it's really exciting to see that. Um, in my work with Sidney Robertson Cowell, I've been um, excited partly by her correspondence, her field notes, her hearing her voice, um, which comes through really strongly, um, gossip. And uh, she kept copies of things. They're carbons and, uh, of things. Um, that she sent in to the Library of Congress. So, um, you know, talking to so-and-so about this and talking to so-and-so about that. A lot of it having to do with the rapport um, with the people she's recording and or all the problems in trying, you know, I went to his barber shop, I couldn't find him, I went to all the other barber shops, you know, sort of telling you about the process and um, sort of hearing her voice and then also hearing her talking. I've been working with the WPA California Collection with, with Sydney talking about working with WPA in DC and in San Francisco. And I guess what, so that's, so in a way I feel like I've been privileged to, to have someone who was so verbose and so man, many layered and complicated as Sydney. But so I'm curious with Aldona's work, you did talk a little bit about uh, the school teachers speaking a little bit about the context and sort of um, being from outside. Um, and I wondered um, how much um, more of that can you find in letters or other kinds of documentation? Um, I, I wonder sometimes, because I've worked with Sydney, I think women are more evocative about all of this personal stuff and the mechanics of doing field work. But I think maybe my view is skewed, so I'm curious to hear um, further. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of... Um, a lot of personal letters that give you a real sense of their personalities um, and in some challenges that they're facing and some frustrations. Um, Alfreda Peel specifically, she's got letters to Arthur Kyle Davis in the archive that um, it, it just reads like, I mean, it's, it's like me, what, it's like my soap opera. <laughs> um, they're just like, her personality really comes through. You really get the sense that she is, um, a really outspoken person, a really outspoken woman. Um, and actually there's, it's one of the more interesting things I've gotten from the archive, which I actually should have included now that I think about it, um, is 
uh, Alfreda's conversations with Arthur Cal Davis, and they seem to have a pretty close friendship. But they have they had conversations about um, a group of rival folklorists in Virginia, um, which is uh, uh, John Powell and Annabelle Morris Buchanan, who did the White Top Folk Festival. And there really seemed to be this um, this rivalry going on, where the Virginia Folklore Society felt like this other group of collectors was uh, sort of usurping their authority and also um, doing it in an exploitative sense. Um, and so you get, there's letters from Alfreda Peel to Arthur Kyle Davis where she's saying, you know, John Powell asked me to sing on um, this NBC radio broadcast. Can you compose my letter saying no? I'm kind of scared to. <laughs> um, and then she says, I'm going to forward you any letters that I get from him unopened. And you can open them because I'm scared to. I don't like him. Um, and she also... At um, one point, she discovers a folk festival in Back Creek, um, and she starts to participate in it, or she starts to um, observe it, and she writes to Arthur Cal Davis, um, you know, this is this folk festival is gotten up for the people by the pe people of Back Creek. I'm assisting mainly as an observer. God forbid I act as Mrs. Buchanan. Um, and I think... Mm -hmm. um, you know, that sort of speaks to this. Uh, there's a real, it's a, a bit of a class thing bet between um, Buchanan and Peel. Um, and there's also the sense that um, Peel sees herself as a friend of the people that she's looking at, where she sees Buchanan as a sort of outside exploiter. Um, it's just one thing. I don't, but you do get, yeah, a real sense of the experience out in the field and like these personal connections and personal rivalries. Well, person, that's, yeah. that's fascinating. Um, so, and for Cheryl, you've got two very different women, um, Sydney on the one hand, and then Margaret. It, your, the clip that you played, uh, the recording, was, was fabulous. To, he to actually hear Margaret Valiant's voice. Yeah. Were there, are there other um, places in her recordings where it sort of veers into a conversation with a, with a performer or... Not in the collection itself. Um, mm -hmm. um, there, it's more with, there are several interviews that I found with her later, like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, but she is much, she keeps her cards much closer to her chest uh, and than Sydney. Um, and I often find myself, it's actually sort of the reading between the lines that she has things in her letters that will say something um, about one of the, men running one of the agencies and then it would say in parentheses like double entendre if you know what I mean and I was like no I don't know what you mean <laughs> like, um, so so yeah so I, I feel like I, I mean I have a similar experience with Sydney where she kind of puts everything out there um, and you know writes I, I feel like the, my perfect thing from Sydney from this time was that she had a broken typewriter that couldn't do um spaces but she wrote the letter anyway and so and the, it's kind of the way sometimes you feel about her and her opinions and her you know just her observations and she just had so much to say and so it's just this block of text with no spaces um so yeah i mean i um i mean thinking about you know these tape recorded conversations it's like it's so amazing to be able to to, to chart the process, um, and that's something that's that's missing. I mean, the other thing that I would say is that I think when I started this project, I assumed because it was a federal agency that I would just go and all of the records would be all in one place. Um, <laughs> and that's not true at all for the New Deal, and especially these programs, um, you know, that weren't, that are sort of seen as peripheral um, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, so I feel like there's still a lot hidden and to be learned. Um, and I, you know, I wish, I wish there was more. And that's why I, by, you know, c coming across that, um, that clip of her talking to those men was, I, I mean, amazing. <laughs> so basically, um, there's there's information about the process and their relationships with people, but then there's also the material that they've collected, which has not necessarily seen the light of day. So for Anne, um, 
I wondered, and I haven't looked at the field reports, are the, and this may be a totally stereotypical thing to say, but are the women's field reports different qualitatively from the men's uh, field reports? Are there, is there more about relationships and uh, making contact and rapport and personal connections? Um, so I haven't spent um, a lot of time approaching the field notes in that way, but I think that would be a fascinating thing to do. I mean, because, um, especially in the early field projects, a lot of the women field workers were actually looking at food ways and quilting and things. I think some of the subject matter is definitely different um, mm. in these field notes. I, I, I can think of, of one example from, I don't remember if it was New River or Coal River, where the person writing the field notes was, was concerned that the person they were talking to was, was sharing too much personal information. And there was this note that was like, Mary, can we delete this? You know, and it just seemed like, like I hadn't really seen, it was all in capital letters and things like that. And it, and it, and it just kind of did kind of stand out as, you know, maybe there was a little bit more thinking um, along the lines of, of sharing these deep personal stories and in in, in making it in the recording and being very concerned about about that. But um, I haven't really holistically looked at the field notes, and but, but I think that would be really interesting to look at. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wonder, I mean, it's the materials they collected which have not really gotten attention. But then I also wonder, uh, I think work needs to be done on what additional uh, perspectives have, have some women um, had that sort of enhance our understanding of the whole process of collecting and, you know, the reasons for collecting, their background socioeconomically or whatever. Um, I just wonder how that'll, that'll contribute to the whole story. And I'd like to open up the, um, the conversation. Okay. Oh, questions. the wonderful Cecil Sharp did to influence Virginia collectors, but I would really love to know more about how they influenced him and his collecting techniques. Mm. Well, I, I don't know how they influenced him and his collecting techniques, but um, I, I, he was, the years that he came through, um, I mean, he obviously, he actually contributed a lot to their collection too, and was a, was a big contributor. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not so sure about. Uh, I haven't looked too much into um, the correspondence between Sharp and Smith. Is, there, is, there, is it at your university? It would be. Yeah. Wow. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Steve. Uh, I have a question for Cheryl, which um, involves the sort of extreme secrecy that you see in the settlement administration, um, which doesn't seem to have pertained from the very beginning because uh, Charlie did publish about six songs on those broadsides. And he told a story in an oral history uh, in which uh, after he published The Dodger, his boss, um, Tugwell, got a call from uh, Representative Vinson, who was a powerful Republican congressman, threatening to defund the resettlement administration because uh, the song began The Candidate's a Dodger. Um, and but the only version of that story that I've ever heard came directly from Charlie in an oral history. And I wonder if Sydney refers to it at all, and if you think that might be, that, that incident itself might have been behind a lot of that secrecy where she was you know, directed not to discuss the project at all. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know the timing of when right. that happened. Um, I mean, um, her trip was December 36, so um, yeah, the, the music unit had only been in existence for less than a year, I right. think, or a little more than a year. Um, Sydney talks about that, but in her reminiscences, I don't know, I can't, um, which is another thing that is tricky, I think, about working with, right. um, with these figures who then went back and sort of 
told the narrative. Um, so it's Sydney, we, there is actually, the AFC has a collection of Sydney's reminiscences. And so it's always a sort of going back and forth between the actual doc, historical documentation and then what she remembers. And um, I, that wasn't made explicit, but it is, an, it is interesting um, uh, to think about whether there was some incident that made them go underground. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the fact that they weren't in the, um, uh, in the executive, uh, in the report, in the annual report, um, makes me think that it might have been all along. Um, and, and I think that not, it wasn't necessarily only tied to um, the fact that, uh, you know, the, the cooperative education, but also just that the resettlement administration was battling this idea that they were providing luxury to the poor. Um, and so they really tried to keep any evidence of that, you know, away um, from the press and things like that. But yeah, that, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. And Thank you, all three of you, for it's such really interesting presentations. I, I'm curious, uh, Aldona, mm -hmm. right? um, were the school teacher collectors, one, is there any information about the context in which they collected? Like, did they use equipment, or were they mostly writing down? Did they do this, like, in school, or did they go tramping out, you know, on, you know, into the brush and find people up in the mountains? And then I'm interested to know, if they were using, if they wanted to integrate these ballads into the curriculum, what was the censoring mechanisms and who did that? I mean, did they just use everything? I just did a BYOBH assignment with my students, Be Your Own Ballad Hunter. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and they're always just totally amazed at the content of these ballads, you know, murder and premarital sex and you know, walking in the woods and coming out pregnant and all these things. And they just can't believe it, which is, of course, one of the reasons that I do it. But they just use all these in the, you know, in the schoolhouse then? Or who was, who was picking and choosing? What, and how, how were they used in the curriculum? Um, OK, so I'll, I'll try to answer this in order. Um, first, so uh, the school teachers didn't use recording equipment is all uh, handwritten. Um, there's a lot of um, notebooks that are submitted, which is actually pretty interesting. Um, there's some notebooks submitted, and you can see, um, like, Alfreda Peel has her 1916 notebook, um, and it's marked up by by uh, the university folks, you know, just like, you know, we found this one, we found this one. Oh, this one's not a true ballad. Um, mm -hmm. So some get called and some get kept. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's written uh, mostly written verses, but then also these uh, sheet music. And then more and more the sheet music starts to um, come to the fore. And they actually, uh, so the recording was done by Arthur Kyle Davis in uh, collaboration with uh, Lorenzo Turner of Fisk. They sort of shared a recording machine. Um, and so when Virginia had it, they made all these recordings at uh, the houses of several um, collectors, Alfreda Peel, Juliet Fauntleroy, even Annabelle Buchanan, even though they had this rivalry. Um, and then they use those recordings to make more accurate transcriptions, um, which is not how we think about them today. But yeah, they wanted more accurate transcriptions. Um, as far as how the teachers incorporated into their curriculum, oh, actually, so, and um, the idea was that um, you would go into your classroom and ask your students, do you or do your grandparents know these songs and get that information that way? But then there were collectors like Alfreda Peel um, and uh, Juliet Fauntleroy who would like, actually no, more Alfreda Peel. Juliet Fauntleroy was staying more in her schoolhouse, um, but would actually go out into the mountains and find ballads. Um, I don't know too much about you know, the limitations of it being the Virginia Folklore Society archive means it's mostly you see what's coming in and not really the, the reverse and how it's going out and how it's used in the curriculum. So unfortunately, I don't really, really know about that. And Daisy? Uh, this question is for Anne. And I'm wondering if we know roughly just the percentage of uh, women folklorists in the AFC collection, um, how many were married or had children or were uh, Yeah, that's a really interesting um, 
information to know, and no, I, we don't have, have that information. Um, I really feel like with, with a lot of looking at some of these contemporary uh, field workers, it's just kind of getting started and finding out some of these things. Um, I, as far as um, how many were married or had, had children, the, the, the children come up frequently sort of in passing in conversations, although very, very directly in the Blue Ridge Parkway project because the Eilers had, had a six-month-old baby, Andrew Eiler, that they were carrying around with them <laughs> on the field trip, and there's pictures of Andrew Eiler all over the place where they're like, tickle, tickle, tickle. You know, I mean, it's like at the planning meetings, you know, and he's, you know, dancing around. Uh, and apparently on field work trips, you know, they would be going into churches and whatnot, and they'd be passing the baby around the congregation, you know. I mean, it really kind of helped them, you know, be – you know, real people with the communities where they were, you know, talking, talking about children. And I will say in the Montana project, this came up um, when, which was part of a clip that I didn't play at that same planning meeting where they were talking about, like, the difficulties of of getting, um, getting some of the women's folklore. And um, Kay uh, was talking um, about, Kay Young was talking about how uh, well, you know, every time we wanted to talk to somebody, they were they were busy. And it was like, oh, the school year is about to start, or the school year has started, or now it's you know the holidays are coming. My kids are going to be home, and there were a lot of these uh, excuses. And and um, I think it was um, some of the, I think it was Barry Tolkien that was like, well, maybe that's just sort of a rhetorical thing or whatever. They're busy, and she was like. Um, when I was getting my kids ready for school, like, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want anybody sitting there. And they were like, well, maybe if we had documented how do you get your kids ready for school, you know, that would have been an, an approach to take rather than saying, can I talk to you about your canning traditions or something like that? You know, I mean, it was, it, it, I find that very interesting and that comes up in, in conversations. Um, and then as far as how many field workers um, are black or, you know, coming from other um, ethnic groups throughout. Um, yeah, Beverly Robinson, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, there, there, aren't, there aren't that many, especially from, from that time period. Um, I, and I mean, this will come up with the Latina um, folklore that Alina is talking, because she left, uh, talking about later, um, that that is, I think, has been a, a, a challenge um, for, for this field work, for, for sure, so. Stephanie? Um, listening to you talk about the work in the 30s and talking about the work in the 70s, and you have, you have a sense that there's some progress there in the kinds of things that women can do and participate in. And, all and yet, if you look at the 30s and some of the things that they were doing are just amazing for the time when there were more social restrictions on what women could do. I just, I'm amazed mm -hmm. at Sydney Robinson Cowell and what she was able to get away with. <laughs> and I wonder if you had a sense of people in some way trying to stop or limit what women could do in the field or, or question their, their being in the field at all, um, which I had found in other situations, but you're talking about different groups of people. Um, I would say for, for Sydney specifically, she seemed to, uh, and um, Kathy might have something to say about this, but in my, I feel like, um, she saw herself as being able to um, exist and thrive in a world of men, kind of from the beginning. Like, um, I mean, I feel like she said things like, you know, I, I became so comfortable with the equipment and I would find myself in these, convers these technical conversations about the recording equipment with this group of men, who, which, d you know, they don't usually let women into those conversations. Um, Sydney, I mean, going back to when she was growing up, I mean, she she came from privilege, um, and um, but she, you know, pulled herself out of uh, her elite girls' school and decided to go to a public um, tech high school because she wanted to be an engineer. And she said, and she called it a boys. It was a it was just a public school. I think that that program was mostly <laughs> boys, men, you know, high school. Um, but I kind of feel like I saw all of these examples of times when she, in particular, was willing to live outside those restrictions. Um, and um, I don't. In terms of Margaret, it's more complicated, and I feel like I'm. I'm. It's still evolving my understanding about her. She. Um, 
she was at all men often called her you know striking uh, she was very warm very charismatic um, and I think that she used more sort of traditional femininity as to um, you know, to, to her advantage, um, except like in, w as we listened when she was completely not, you know, listened to um, in terms of dealing with the equipment. So anyway, I have some other, I mean, both Sydney and Margaret um, were divorced uh, without children, living independently. They'd both kind of, um, by this time, they, they were in their, in their 30s um, and they had kind of forged their own path um, in different ways already. Um, so I can't speak to the experience of other women um, doing this kind of collecting work. Um, but yeah, it's definitely interesting to think about. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, Marguerite Chapiaz, who was a linguist who went out. And that's actually a connection. You just, you just made a nice link for me because uh, Marguerite Chapaz also learned how to use the equipment, and the other women on the team did not. And it made, a, and she went off on her own and did recordings because she was able to do that. And she just didn't care about the gossip, which there was, and and um, people telling her she, she shouldn't do it. So it, uh, that's actually interesting. To me. I think also the New Deal era. During so few years, so much was done. Also in photography. Women, um, I, somehow I got the feeling, I've gotten the feeling that it was an era, era of, a, a short era of, of uh, social mobility. I mean, it was sort of chaos socially so that, and even in African Americans in, in um, working in WPA and in the various um, federal programs, that they this was not an academic setting. This was something new. And people who had a lot of energy and rushed in sometimes were able to make a niche for themselves where, um, like Sydney was not an academic and, and, uh, and Margaret wasn't, I mean, that, these, that somehow they were able to fit in in the social chaos of the era. Yeah. Well, I think Eleanor Roosevelt, I mean, had like mm -hmm. a direct hand I and mean, she she actually convened all the women working in agencies, like invited them to a tea every I don't I don't know how often it happened, but she cultivated that. Um, and I, I do think that there was this sort of blip um, during the New Deal when there were these opportunities. And what I found is that then when the New Deal ended, um, you know, the, the, there really wasn't anything like that for them. And, um, and they both took very different paths. Um, but they both rose into leadership positions, um, you know, at that sort of director level within the New Deal. So it's something to, be, to think about in terms of what that structure allowed for women. I mean, within and reason. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Sydney became Mrs. Henry Cowell and did not do very much recording after the New Deal. Right, exactly. She got married, she d and, um, and Margaret um, adamantly decided not to do that and sort of um, did some, um, like, ad hoc. She, would, she was writing pageants, and she said that she worked for, wrote some radio plays. She was living in New York. And then um, in the 1950s, she was called back to take care of her um, ailing father and um, moved back to Tennessee and sort of, um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely felt like this opening and closing um, in terms of the opportunities for them. Yes? Uh, the Virginia, uh, again, collectors, were any of them African Americans and did they collect from African Americans? Um, there's a recording of one gospel quartet um, and that's as far as I know um, the collect in the collectors n yeah none were African-American except for the partnership with Lorenzo Turner but that's I mean he's at a completely different university um, and that's something I'm actually trying to get at at my dissertation um, like the specificity of race in all of this and I'm really seeing the notation practice as a, as part of that um, as something that um, that specifically like educated white women would be doing. Um, 
as, especially their works in like music clubs um, and as, as teachers. And I'm also seeing, um, actually in relation to the last question too, um, I'm seeing the work uh, of the women I'm looking at in my dissertation as sort of an outgrowth of um, like around the turn of the century, it seems like there's a lot of work for women that was sort of getting out into the field, like, you know, settlement schools, um, traveling nurses, um, even field workers for other organizations, just like sort of, I don't know, like soft skills, um, like being able to talk to people and um, being not seen as a non-threatening force. Um, I'm seeing this work as one, and that was, I mean, that was a little bit earlier um, like around, yeah, around the turn of the century. To see. Lisa, I think one more question. Lisa? I'm interested in with the Virginia Ballad Women and looking at it musically. We've talked about the various filters through which the content has been coming through the village, through the Virginia Ballad collectors. These women have a very rich musical tradition, but it's probably informed by, by their classical music or quasi classical music upbringing. So when it comes, I think it's just fascinating that they were the ones that brought the tunes to the Virginia Ballads. But when they did so, what choices did they make? Uh, as we know from listening, a lot of the field work uh, recordings, tunes often change from verse to verse. A lot of uh, semitones or quarter or teeny weeny microtones get incorporated. Was there any interest in? ornamentation or vocal style or improvisation in the ways they tried to transcribe some sort of an earth form of the, of the tunes. Yeah, um, they, act, they talk more about the <coughs> difficulties in capturing those, tu those sorts of aspects. They talk about like, you know, the mountain wine, that, that, that tone that you can't get <laughs> um, from notation, and also um, singers like sliding up to a note or, or not fully staying on one or even some uh, some transcribers found it difficult to fit the melodies within a standard like 4-4 four, four, or however they were um, or 4-4 four, four, or 6-8 or however they were um, putting it in so there's that difficulty um, and as far as I know and I, I want I want to look into this a little bit more but that at least the, the, in their published works that seems to be their stance that like yes, this is an Im imperfect method. And so we'll just talk, we'll talk about the ways that it's imperfect. Thank you. <laughs> it's a very interesting perspective you brought on. Great session. Very exciting beginning to the symposium. Thanks, Nancy, for organizing it. <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>we're going to now go for a short um, session we, we um, are taking advantage of this uh, symposium to also highlight some of our collections and we've a we asked our colleagues the archivists to come forward and talk about some of the collections that we have that we think that are, were either their favorites or they're working on or we think need a little more um, Advertisement is the wrong word, but promotion, <laughs> highlighting. And so we're going to do two very short um, uh, presentations now by uh, two of my colleagues, Jesse Hawkins and Alina um, Magoni. And um, if you'd like to come forward, what we'll do is we'll just run, I think maybe you maybe we'll take questions immediately after each one, just to keep it focused. So let me start by introducing Jesse Hawkins, who's an archivist with the American Folklife Center. And he's just recently joined us in May of this year. And he's previously served as a digital arch 
project archivist at the Wisconsin Center for Film and Theater Research and also with the uh, Rare Book and Manuscript Library in Athens, Georgia. He has an MA in Library and Information Studies from University of Wisconsin-Madison and has also studied Film and African American Studies at University of Georgia. And he's going to be speaking about Nancy Sweezy's collection. Um, so I'm excited to uh, talk about this collection um, because it's it's what I do every day right now. Um, <laughs> it's it's mid processing, um, so it's really exciting to drum up some some excitement about this collection. Um, and really, I'm just going to show y'all a lot of photos. Um, we've um, we've been diving in uh, full time, so there's lots to see. Um, also, these are not official Library of Congress digitization. Uh, uh -huh quality photos. Um, this one on the left is literally a picture of a slide through a uh, viewfinder, so um, forgive me. But this is Nancy Sweezy, um, and she is the namesake of the Nancy Sweezy collection. Um, she, most of her work, sh she's mostly known for her work in uh, Jugtown pottery, um, so we'll talk about that. Um, in 2006, she was a NEA National Heritage Fellow. Um, so this is the, the manuscripts as they stand right now, um, as of last night. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> so Nancy uh, produced uh, several books in her uh, work, and the top two are about the Southern pottery tradition, raised in clay. So the one on the left uh, was published by the Smithsonian um, publisher and in 1994 and then on the right uh, republished under Chapel Hill's press in um, in 1994 84 and 94 um, and we'll talk about the other two books as well uh, so this is Ralph Rinsler um, her longtime friend and collaborator on many projects um, she got to know Ralph when she was working in Cambridge in the music scene she was um, the president of the board of Club 47 which was one of the main uh, folk venues, um, and Ralph was uh, seeking out southern musicians for the Newport <coughs> Folk Festival, which he was involved with at the time, um, and he asked Nancy, uh, because she was a potter, to uh, bring up some southern um, traditional craft artists from the south, because she was um, much more focused on material culture, which is another great thing about this collection. Many of our collections focus on uh, songs, folk songs, uh, but this one is much more about um, objects and um, material culture. Um, so Sweezy, Rinsler, and Norman Kennedy established a nonprofit called Country Roads, um, and this would become a very important um, organization in her work. It uh, provided a lot of monetary support and um, allowed her to do a lot of different things in her time. Um, so when she was touring through the South, um, she collected a lot of these objects and traditional crafts, which she sold. Um, she sold in the store Country Roads, uh, which existed for about a year. Um, so they're all very beautiful. <laughs> um, and when she uh, went down to the South to meet the artists who were making these crafts, um, she, she actually got to see, you know, this is the, the person that made this corn husk doll and, um, and W started documenting the actual practice of creating these crafts that she was trying to create a market for in Cambridge. Um, she also studied um, crafts in the Southwest, which the next few photos are from that area of the country. <coughs> Um, and I'm including uh, <laughs> any notes that are accompany the photos when, when we have them. Um, so as you can see, a, a real wealth of um, traditional crafts from weaving, uh, basket making, everything in between. So in 1968, Country Roads uh, purchased Jugtown Pottery, uh, in, which is near uh, Seagrove, North Carolina. And um, that same year, Ralph Rensler uh, became the official head of the Festival of American Folklife um, here in D.C. 
And so their paths sort of diverged as she went to go do this hands-on work of running a pottery. Um, and she uh, established apprenticeships, which were very important at the time, brought a lot of young artists through Jugtown. Um, so this is a Jugtown pottery timeline, but they were uh, founded in the late teens, uh, early 20s. This is the Jugtown crew with Nancy Sweezy in the center. Um, they had a traditional uh, wood-burning kiln and produced a lot of pottery. These, this is the Owens, um, Vernon Owens on the left and his wife Pam. Um, extremely talented uh, potters. This is Vernon again working on the wheel. Um, so I could just show you photos of these all day. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> um, some, some rest and relaxation as well. Um, this is Nancy actually uh, turning herself. Um, so Nancy also really um, brought a lot of, she was very adept at uh, PR and sort of bringing press attention to this area that had um, sort of fallen off uh, post uh, prohibition really. Um, and <coughs> she, there are a lot of clippings from the collection uh, where you can see that she was bringing, you know, these, these large donors to Jugtown and um, she was getting the word out there that this area of North Carolina was very fertile country for pottery. Uh, this this was a big one. 1977, um, Walter Mondale's wife Joan uh, came down. Uh, it was the year that Carter Mondale took office, um, and she visited Jugtown. And um, as you can see, Nancy Sweezy was front and center. Uh, this is probably my favorite press clipping. Um, this is a um, promotional material from the accounting firm that did Jugtown's books. <laughs> Uh, and I think it just really shows you that they're like <coughs> proud of their client in Jugtown. Um, ancient and modern <laughs> contrasts. Uh, um, and my favorite part is that they call Nancy Sweezy, they say, at right, owner Miss Nancy Sweezy, a sophisticate in overalls. <laughs> uh, I love this photo. <laughs> I think it's so funny. <laughs> Um, so she was in North Carolina until the 80s, um, and she actually sold the pottery to the Owens family, um, and they still run it today. Um, and so she traveled um, throughout the South and Southwest and created this book, Raised in Clay. Um, so she visited a lot of other <coughs> potteries outside of Jugtown as well. I love the backsplash of all the clay. <laughs> Um, so she did a lot to promote other potteries as well as Jugtown. Um, in 1985, she moved back up to Boston um, and started the Refugee Arts Group. Um, and they similarly did an apprenticeship program where they would invite sort of masters of folk crafts um, and have them mentor younger practitioners. Um, so this is from the Lowell Folk Fest. She was um, involved with Lowell. Um, she also worked on the Folk Life Center's field project in Lowell. Um, so this is uh, just to give you an idea of what um, the promotional material would look like for a night of programming at um, Refugee Arts. Um, so I believe that's the master on the right and the apprentice on the left. <laughs> Um, so everything from music and dance to fabric arts, Irish fiddlers. Um, this uh, kite maker says um, down on the right hand side, um, he's a Cambodian kite maker available to demonstrate in schools, libraries, and community organizations. So it's very much about getting recent immigrants, um, allowing them to retain these traditional crafts and find an outlet to, um, to perform or keep them alive in the community. Um, so then in the 90s, um, she started uh, taking many trips to Armenia and documenting uh, folk culture there, uh, which eventually became a book that she edited with her son, Sam. 
Um, and Sam Sweezy became a professional photographer. So a lot of these amazing photographs uh, were taken by him. They did um, work throughout the whole area. Um, s m right now, since this is mid-processing, I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, but um, yeah, I'm hoping to find like a slide log at some point in the manuscripts that will tell me exactly <laughs> where <laughs> most of these were taken. You don't just have to travel there. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is uh, traditional bread making, uh, lavash. Um, Um, and always back to pottery. So um, that was just a snapshot of this collection. Um, it will hopefully have a finding aid up um, at, at the end of this year. Um, and I also want to thank Carolina Restrepo, who has helped me uh, sort through the several thousand slides. Um, thank you. The, my, the next colleague I'm going to introduce is Alda Alina Migoni, who has only recently joined our staff, and we're delighted to have her. She's a reference library at the American Folklife Center now, and she has um, degrees in Latin American studies from, the, from UCLA, and she's originally from San Diego. And uh, her, res <coughs> her research interests include uh, Latinx in, uh, studies and human rights and uh, art as protest, especially in Latin America. She's, in addition to being on her staff, she's also president of the Hispanic Cultural um, Society at the Library of Congress and is a member at large at, in uh, Reforma, the National Association to Promote L Library Information Services to Latinos and Spanish-speaking um, um, Spanish affiliates of ALA. And um, she's going to be speaking about Latinx collections in the, in um, some of them, <laughs> because we have lots, in uh, the American Folklife Center. Please welcome Alina. Oops. So, sneak peek. <laughs> Hi, um, as Nancy mentioned, my name is Alina Migoni, and I have been here since May, so a very short amount of time. And in my brief experience here, my colleagues and some researchers themselves have pointed me in the direction of interesting collections. So this will serve as a lightning round of sorts in 15 minutes for collections mm -hmm. of Latinas in the archive. Um, three collections where the Latinas are the ethnographers or uh, folklorists, and the fourth, um, a very amazing 100-year-old informant that, uh, of a new recently acquired collection. So the first collection I'd like to bring your attention to would be Musica de los Cultos Africanos en Cuba. This was compiled by Lydia Cabrera and uh, recorded by Josefina Tarafa. So some of you may be aware of Cabrera's extensive work. Um, this collection includes 14 12-inch discs with this title. Um, they feature instrumentals, prayers, salutes, and songs, mostly recorded in the Matanzas province of Cuba and some in Havana. Uh, these are especially significant because Cabrera was not known for her recording of her fieldwork. She extensively used uh, index cards and her memory. Uh, so Tarafa, a friend and photographer, did fieldwork with her, and these 14 discs actually um, are the basis of one of our extreme uh, publications uh, and long history of publishing, and the basis of El Monte, her transformative work. So like I said, 14 discs. It also includes one booklet with um, a article and photographs by Tarafa and the article by Cabrera explaining these discs, and they give amazing context to what it is we're looking at. 
so here's just poorly qual <laughs> poorly scanned quality but um, interesting nonetheless of what she has to say about this time in uh, Matanzas. So Tarafa was the daughter of a, both were daughters of um, well-off families, and Tarafa had uh, a sugar mill. The family had a sugar mill in Matanzas, and that was their base for their field work. And so in Matanzas province, um, there was a large um, Afro-Cuban population, descendants of Yoruba <laughs> uh, culture. And so this is extremely rare field work, um, and very prolific and important. Uh, I will hold off for the music until the end and uh, <coughs> see how long I, I have. So from this collection, four recordings uh, were published, four CDs, three from Smithsonian Folkways, uh, and the fourth from the Library of Congress Endangered Music Project. And so I wanted to speak kind of briefly more about this project. Um, Ken Bilby in his discussion of, of the collection uh, said that this music was recorded by uh, Tarafa in the 50s under the guidance of Cabrera. Um, I think it, from my understanding, it was that she was the photographer and C Cabrera was the, the ethnographer, the field worker with a more extensive experience. So um, that's interesting. And a researcher actually brought that to my attention that there might be some future conversations there um, as to who who decided what. Tarafa actually, like I said, prodded Cabrera in the <coughs> pathway to record. Um, she had her recording material. She was very interested in the technology, and so thus the 14 discs were born. Um, I also want to say that Cabrera spoke about this time uh, in the introduction for El Monte, and very roughly translated from the Spanish. She said, I've wanted to, without changing their funny and peculiar modes of expression, these elders that I've met, uh, many of them children of Africans, the most aware and respectful continuators of their tradition, and whose trust and confidence I could gain, and be, I wanted them to be heard without an intermediary, exactly as they spoke to me, by those who study the deep and living imprint left on this island, by the magical and religious concepts, beliefs, and practices of blacks imported from Africa for several centuries of interrupted trafficking. So she's well known for her commitment to literal translations, to making sure that the truth was heard and that she didn't have this editorializing version of their, their songs and their religious beliefs. And then uh, I also have a quick story. A researcher came in and brought to my attention that the Lydia Cabrera papers at the University of Miami were actually missing this important field work. There's about 1,800 digitized items, manuscripts, and mostly fo photographs from what I could gather. But that Isabel Castellanos, a well-known scholar in Afro-Cuban religion and uh, music and traditions, uh, is, her, is Cabrera's heir, an intellectually property rights holder, and that she had her own section of these 14 discs, these, uh, her own copy that were lost to time, loaned to someone, and never returned. Um, and it was her life's regret that these weren't part of this collection. And so I told the researcher, I'm like, You're, you know her. I can do that. That's what AFC is all about. We're ethical in this way. So uh, hopefully I can help facilitate a repatriation uh, and a duplication of the, this material for her. And um, we're in contact now. So let, stay tuned. So the next collection I wanted to address would be Edna Carrillo de Boggs, the recordings from the Dominican Republic. These 39 sound discs were actually recorded for the Dominican government, and so part of the 1948 duplication project, the Library of Congress kept a copy, gave the originals back to the government of the Dominican Republic, and gave a copy to Mrs. Boggs, as she was later known. These uh, recordings include field work of folk music, songs, dance, as well as religious holidays. So Edna here, this is a scan from one of her books in our collection, uh, was an educator and studied folklore at the Universidad Autónoma de Santo, uh, Santo Domingo and, in tra and traveled to the US in 1946 to continue her studies. She studied under uh, Professor Boggs, Ralph Boggs, and married him two years later, <laughs> so, where they eventually settled in Miami, Florida. She was a educator and folklorist, and she actually founded <coughs> the first folklore society in Santo Domingo in uh, 1947. And from there, 
She also was the founder of the Bulletin of Dominican Folklore uh, that ran from 47 to 48, I believe. So another well-known uh, scholar who we have some really amazing recordings from. So I think we have time. I forgot to run a timer. So. Oh. So I've been listening to that at my desk and kind of annoying everyone because I get up every five <laughs> seconds to like, I mean, you saw me last yesterday. So, um, so that's one very high energy. Let's see. We'll return to that. Um, the, four, the third collection uh, is a recent acquisition. So we went from the late 40s uh, and late 50s to now 2016, both acquisitions from that year, uh, these next two collections. Mincy Martinez Rivera, um, she collected in Michoacán, Mexico, uh, from the Seri lands, uh, or sorry, wrong collection, back it up. <laughs> Budapicha cultural traditions for her dissertation research. She uh, studied with them for 2007 to 2011, but what is actually very interesting is that the concentration of materials are from 2009 to 2010. She spent a whole calendar year um, in this uh, community and did full life cycle events, uh, weddings, baptisms, religious holidays, saints days, uh, funerals, and so she really did a day in the life and um, this collection has 10 hours of sound, 5,000 photographs that have not been processed yet, otherwise you would have had gotten 30 minutes of, <laughs> of photographs, uh, and the manuscripts, which I think are extremely interesting. So these manuscripts are 12 notebooks of her field work, and so while we do talk at the AFC about the end result of field work um, and the beautiful <coughs> photographs and oral histories that are gathered, I think it's also very important to note that AFC collects the actual notes and um, process of these ethnographers and folklorists. So for instance, this is her first <coughs> journal. Um, this is mid-journal. I scanned a page from June of 2008. And here she's talking to, I believe, a friend that she's staying with, Soksa, and said, how do you navigate the world outside of this area of Michoacan? And Soksa said, well, uh, I just tell them where I'm from. I know that nobody speaks my language outside of this community. And luckily, when I was in Guadalajara, the, the uh, question here, she said she had another community member that she spoke her language with. And I think what's really interesting is on the right, she says, I really have to develop, better develop my techniques for interviews. And I really need to better develop my questions. <laughs> and so and then she has a list of possible informants. So first journal. There's 12. So later on, this is March of 2009. The last one was June of 2008. She's a prolific writer. And so she's decided to start numbering, if you can see in the top right corner, uh, her journal entries. And so this, she says, she's had a warm, uh, she's been warmly received by the community. And she speaks at length about her emotional connection to the people um, that she's working with, the temperature every day, what they cooked. Uh, what exactly it is that she can do around the house and the conversations that are had and the things that people would like to do for her on her behalf. So it's really an emotional journey if you feel like digging in. Um, and here, not even the last of the 12 journals, she's already on page 782, continuation. So she mm -hmm. is a methodical note taker and I think that this collection, when I see the photographs, I'm sure I'll be speaking a different tune, but for now, I think that these uh, notebooks are just an amazing overview and insight into field work today and into this community. Um, it really is, I, I was just, I spent like a few hours with it just reading and I felt kind of closer to her in that way. So I need a meter. So 2016 again, Margot Holy Collection of Seri Music. Uh, Margot again ingratiated herself with the community, uh, had a, a kind of adopted family that she spoke with at length 
and it and the Seri people are in the state of Sonora, Mexico. Um, this is off the col- the coast of the Gulf of California, so across from the Baja California Peninsula. And so, what's really interesting about this is that the Seri people, um, I believe, 20 years ago, their population was down to 75 individuals, and they are now have 500 uh, uh, individuals in the community. It's a very small community. Um, This includes 42 soundists, our first accession of the materials. They are CDs from 39 artists and storytellers (coughs) and singers and dancers. And what's interesting is that the 42 discs, they're actually available for purchase um, from her collection and uh, and that all of the proceeds go back to the community and the artists. Um, but that we have over 100 or 1,100 songs uh, by these 39 uh, storytellers and artists. So I wanted to talk about Isabel Torres Molino. She was 100 years old at the time of being interviewed and died approximately four months after uh, being interviewed by Margot. Or holy, sorry, first name basis, and I don't, I don't feel. That. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done a PhD in this, so I'm, I, I just feel like I know her. Um, so, she was a hundred years old, and what's interesting is that uh, Holy was was introduced to geoglyphs on the island of uh, Tiburon Island, meaning Shark Island, off the coast of Sonora. And these geoglyphs, one person showed them to her, and she saw a publication from approximately like 35, maybe 40 years ago now, describing these geoglyphs. But when she went to do her research, she actually found that none of the Seri people she spoke to in the community had any idea of um, the, the origin stories for the geoglyphs. And so she was told to speak with this person. She drove down an hour south from where she was located and met with Isabel. And Isabel said, I do think um, I am the only person to know this. Uh, and I'm glad that you met me, and I'm glad I'm able to tell this. And so it was, it was really interesting reading this uh, oral history. Um, and so she learned the stories of the giants. Here are the geoglyphs. Uh, two races of giants, one larger than the other, who drew supernatural powers from these geoglyphs. And the icons have different meanings. So um, I won't go into it right now, but the cross, for instance, gave a certain, um, a certain power. Um, the concentric circle or bullseye there. So there was a lot of different stories relating to the iconography. So she not only remembered, you know, all of about the two races of giants, but she remembered with clarity what these geoglyphs meant. Um, So that is a very important oral history, and that will be part of the second um, accession of this continuing uh, acquisition. So, and here is a landscape of Tiburon Island. Um, what's also interesting about this is that many, since many of the Seri people didn't know that these existed, when she brought it to their attention and, um, and it was, it's still known as a sacred space, whether or not they would known about the geoglyphs, she has now been told and will continue to keep their location a secret. Um, what actually brought her to publish, uh, these are scans from a book from this material, to publish this book is that a photographer, while she was doing her field work, went in and started taking aerial photos and kind of disrupting the area. And so she decided to beat them to the punch and maintain the Seri people's intellectual property. So this was um, done in order to maintain their connection to the the space. And Tiburon Island is actually uninhibited except for some uh, military postings on, I think, the southern edge. Um, and so even though people aren't allowed to access their, uh, their you know, uh, homeland uh, in some ways, uh, they still want to maintain the secrecy of this from outsiders. So I think I went fast enough to play some music. I was trying to, you know, keep it going. So... So... Here is... Some really beautiful songs. Let me let me do the let me do this first. And 
so I'll leave you on. Yemaya pa mi bonao. Pa mi bonao. Pa mi bonao. Iya olomi, iya orefa. Iya olomi, iya orefa. So hopefully I've enticed you to come visit and explore all the Latinas in our collection. I want to thank everybody for a wonderful morning. We will continue at 2 o'clock. In the meantime, um, might I suggest the upstairs cafeteria on the sixth floor? There are, get to the sixth floor, there are directional signs. And uh, thank you all so much for coming. We'll see you in the afternoon. <laughs>